Welcome back to the Colors of Crutch podcast. My name is Max Sternberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, and I'm joined, as always, by Daddy Satellite himself, the Italian man, the Florian guy, whoever you want to call him, Max P. How are you doing today, Max? I'm doing all right. Doing pretty good. Just getting back into the swing of things after a hell of a weekend. Um, we went down to the Boil, which was the largest CDH tournament ever. Uh, over 220 people put on by our sponsor, Eminence. Um, and we had a blast. I mean, had an amazing time. Um, you know, I didn't do quite as well as I wanted to, but I didn't do terrible. Um, you know, I went two, three and two. We'll get into that later, but, um, got to hang out with a lot of really amazing people, amazing CDH players, uh, jammed all night in the Airbnb. Um, you know, hung out with people, got to go to Angie's, the, uh, you know, the, the, the best damn (laughs) breakfast food you'll ever have in your life. Um, and it just had a good time. A butter and love. Yeah, exactly. Lots of butter, a little bit of egg, maybe some, maybe some bacon, and then more butter. A whole lot of love. A <laughs> whole lot of love. Yeah. So it was a good time. It was a good time. Um, I did take uh, Italian, um, you know, and uh, I was happy with it for the most part. Um, we'll get into you know all of that in a minute. But Max, how did uh, how did you do? First of all, yeah, I did well. I, I know it sounds shitty to say I'm unsatisfied with the result, but I am. Um, I came in I came in second place overall in the largest tournament in history. Uh, I was really close to getting my first dub. Would have been a really cool thing to happen. I will apologize right now for my energy levels. I, I, I pulled an all-nighter on the day going into the tournament. I stayed up till 6 a.m. the night before my flight. I stayed up every night doing Jaeger bombs with people. <laughs> um, I'm I'm in recovery, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little I'm a little tired still. We're we're getting back to it. I was so nice to get to fall asleep and cuddle with my dog again last night. We're getting back to the swing of things, but I'm gonna need another day before I got the energy returned. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And I do. Let's let's try. Let's do. Let's shout out all the things at the beginning for once. Let's just see what happens. Uh, we are we are sponsored by Eminence Gaming, the best damn sponsor in CDH tournament organization and software producing people in the world. Give, let's give them a shout out because they're amazing. And then also, we have a Patreon now. If you love the channel and you like our content and you want to support our content and maybe also get some cool perks, feel free to check that out in the links below. Do not forget to leave us a like and subscribe to the videos. And I also offer CDH coaching. If that's something that's interesting to you, you can contact me on Discord as Wounded Satellite or on Twitter as Wounded Satellite. And we can happily figure that kind of stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Now we we are going to go into the tournament and talk through our our rounds, but uh, you know some of them we'll try to be a little shorter on. Like we don't need to go into everyone in, in quite the same detail, although some were certainly notable enough that we want to do that. Um, and we'll go round by round. But I'll say overall, you know, first give you a quick summary of of my experience at the tournament. You know, um, I went into it expecting to see uh, you know lots and lots of Kinnan, lots of Blue Farm, lots of Sisse. Uh, lots of all of that. And, you know, if you go and you look at the meta um, breakdown, uh, and we'll, we'll get into that at the very end, you'll see that all of those decks were there. I just didn't see them. Um, I played absolutely, actually, I played zero Kinnons. I didn't play against Kinnon even once the entire tournament. Um, I played against a few blue farms, so that, that was fine. But I also ran into two Cricks. I ran into Naya uh, Minsk. I ran into Godo. I played against Jetmir. <laughs> I played against Magda. Um, it was it was an absolute zoo of off meta decks the whole way through, um, which was completely not what I expected to see. Um, and I do think my results suffered a bit as as a result because when you're playing a control deck like like Talion, you know a lot of work goes into picking the right answers for what you expect to see. And in a lot of games, I you know the answers I had were not the right answers and i would have probably preferred to have a little bit more removal and maybe another board wipe in the deck i think would have been pretty good um you know although i still feel like i played my ass off and you know anytime i was in you know a more normal pot i think the deck did everything that i wanted it to do um and also keep in mind like when we were talking to shauna last week and she was going through the decks that really scared her on niv and she talked about you know equitargo and dihada if you're if you're on a, a strategy, it's a control strategy like Talion or Niv, and you're against decks like Crick, who can present more must answer threats than you quickly have answers for at the early stages of the game, it's a really bad matchup. Yeah, <laughs> like you, yeah. You might be you might be happy to see the control deck, you know, and say, oh, I love that they're going to have something for Crick, but they can't do it alone. Yeah, you know? so if exactly. everyone mulligans in a way where they expect you to do everything, it's not going to work out. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of my experience were games where you know the Crick player or or whatever you know fast you know creature based or you know no 
no blue card deck, um, you know, would go for it first. I you know, spend a huge amount of resources stopping. Um, I was very successful at that, but then the next deck in turn order was, you know, set to win. Um, you know, and it was just, it's just kind of the way the tournament went. Um, so how about you? I mean, what was your, your summary? I, I think I, I'll have to double check because we're going through the rounds, but I genuinely think I was against blue farm in all nine rounds. Yeah. Which I would have um, preferred. I, I would have loved that. Yeah. I was against Kinnon two or three times. I was against Sisse like three or four times. Like I, I saw all of them a lot. Yeah. I was against some pods that were double blue farm. Like it's, it was ridiculous. I, I didn't see Sisse even once. Of... No Sisse's. None. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the most off meta deck I saw was the Kiki deck that I definitely will shout out at some point. And that, I mean, that was in my round seven, which was a little weird. It was kind of just an ID. Let's jump right into it. Uh, how did round one go? Yeah, round one. Round one was cool. I was uh, I was going second. Let me see if I can quickly quickly pull up which decks it was because this one went pretty fast, and it's kind of hard to even remember. On the play, we had absolute shocker Blue Farm. We had myself going second. We had Anala going third. And we had Azika going forth. Um, the guy who was on the play let me know. He was like, hey, I was I was talking to Dylan and Cam from Play to Win last night. And exactly what I told them is I, I don't want to face you. <laughs> yep. I said, I said, sorry, bro. <laughs> I'm just a guy. Let's get it. Uh, and then I mulled to, I think, six. I uh, kept a hand that was good amount of mana. On turn one, it was like turn one, like Mana Crypt, Arcane Signet, Land, Armored Scrap Gorger, I think. Into turn two, Cannon plus Perplexing Chimera. Into turn three, Con Sphinx with like Croms and Espers on board. And I was like, let's go. Let's go. That's some four straws they're going to have to do. Um, and, it, and they did have a lot of four straws. <laughs> there, Yeah, people just like triggered the Crom and stuff. I wasn't expecting that to happen when I had the Con Sphinx out. So I drew a pretty schnutty amount of cards. Um, ended up in a situation that like... The, the when I went for it on my on my fourth turn because I immediately was just like I have everything I need here I had a hallbreaker or I already had so much mana from the first couple turns of development and I had like three or four mana rocks in hand I had like one or two counter spells to protect things but like I was just like I played the hallbreaker and then I would try and play the mana rocks and start the loop and every single mana rock was getting countered by Azika and I was looking at my hand and I had counter magic to go against his counter magic but I was like I actually don't need to give a shit about this at all because I just have more rocks to play. So I was like, I'll save my counters for the last one if they actually still have more. So I kept just playing more rocks, they kept countering them, and then, you know, finally the last rock got through. It ended up being a Chrome Mox with nothing imprinted in a Mana Vault to go infinite for colorless, and I was like, here's a here's a Moon Silver Key from hand to go get a colored rock, and they, they scooped it up. And it was pretty quick, pretty efficient. I mean, when you can go when you can go a lot of mana into turn two Chimera, turn three Consphinx, like, that is just such a dominant start. Um, so really happy with that one. Really quick game. Gave me a lot of time to refresh before round two. How was, how was yours? Yeah, so mine was uh, another jungle pod. So uh, I was against going in first seat was Jessica Timna. Uh, I was in second seat. Third seat was uh, Tivit, and fourth seat was Crick. Um, you know, thank God Crick was in fourth. Uh, actually, actually, let me take that back. Crick was in third, and Tivit was in fourth. Um, I stepped right into the control mode. I landed in uh, a turn one Talion. Um, and started drawing cards and draining life totals. So that was working really nicely, especially against Crick. Uh, was able to explain to the table the Crick danger. Uh, everyone got on board and we aggressively uh, attacked the Crick's player's life total, kept it nice and low. Um, Tivit attempted to come down pretty early. Um, and I had, you know, I had all the perfect interaction, you know, off my draws. Uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, Tivit resolves. Uh, in response to the ETB trigger, Shieldred's Edict. Uh, cleaned up, you know, both Tivit and uh, a Ranger Captain that was on board on on Tim Jessica's board. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Uh, I landed a, a Cursed Totem at one point. Oh no, that was actually Tivit landed a Cursed Totem. I was like, thanks, that's fantastic. Um, kept playing control, just building up mana, keeping everyone from able to being able to really do much. Um, and then Tivit went to try to play again using a Dark Ritual. I'm like, yeah, I'll go ahead and mental misstep that uh, Dark Ritual. Tivit player looks sad. Another couple turns goes by. Finally, he lands the Tivit, and I'm like, congratulations, you got your Tivit. Um, flash and Holebreaker her on end step. Uh, cast Imposter Mech on my turn, copying the Tivit. Uh, start the loop, create infinite Tivits. Um, good game? Yep. 
GG. That was it. Also, inf also infinite clue. That's what I'm saying, dude. The Hallbreaker Horror Clones, like you always have an outlet on board. It always works. Uh, it's and, I mean, having having a matchup, having a matchup that's like Italian and Tebbit, where it's two control decks. It's very similar in my brain to when I I remember I talked to Spicer about the Elevir Mirror at one point. I was like, how does that go? And he was like, whoever plays the stacks effects loses because the other person then doesn't have to spend their resource on stacks effects. They can spend the resource on progression. So it seems like a very similar thing where like if Tibbet's the one playing the Cursed Totems and the Crap Diggers Cages and you can focus more on the interaction and like children effects, then they're just going to come ahead there. Yep. Yeah. So nice, nice and easy, clean win felt really good. You know, not the pot I expected, but I was able to play with it just fine. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I think Talion actually has a great matchup versus Crick in particular. Um, you know, the only problem with it is it's just, you know, it doesn't help the table. Crick can't do anything to help anything. It's just helping itself. So sometimes that's really an issue. Um, so that was it for round one. I remember. Uh, feeling good. Both want to know. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was cool after round one. I mean, we were, we were in Atlanta at an Airbnb of 11 guys, like all of our buddies who are the tournament grinders. And dude, like, like uh, one or two didn't, but pretty much all the boys took round one. Like we were like everyone from the squad won round one. We were like, all right, let's get it. Like, this is how we, this is how we started off and show us up. Yeah. Uh, going into my round two, uh, on the play was Malcolm Beckford on Sisse. Yep. I have never gotten to play a game with Malcolm before. And I was informed that on the drive down from New York that had Malcolm and Jorman in the car, they were listening to our Top 15 podcast. And Malcolm heard me talk some shit about Sisse. And he said very clearly, my mission for this weekend is to dunk on satellite with Sisse. Uh, and dunk, dunk he did. Dunk he did. He may have had the slight advantage of being on the play and keeping a seven when I mulled the five and fourth seat. Um, but, but this game was interesting. We had, uh, had Dargo Timna in second seat. Very explosive kind of deck. It was a guy who admitted he was newer to CDH and actually asked us for advice after the game. Really nice guy. Really well how he handled all of that. We had Dylan Skorish, one of our one of our favorite supporters, in third seat on the blinged out Japanese foil Tim Nakram deck. Uh, and then we had myself coming up the rear on Kinnan on a Mulda 5. Uh, this game was interesting. There was there were some decisions I had some, some questions about. Uh, the big one was on like turn two, I think it was, or turn three, Skorish or it was, it was either Tar Dimna, Tar Timna Dargo or Scourge cast a Red Blast targeting Lavinia. It was it was Timna Dargo. Timna Dargo cast a, a Red Blast targeting Lavinia. And Malcolm had the, the SWAT, where Malcolm had started this game with turn one Lavinia on the play, which was very nice to have. Uh, Malcolm had the SWAT. And at that point, I had Kinnon on board with like five mana and three cards in hand. And Scourge in third seat had like five mana, seven cards in hand and a Mystic Rumor. And I was like, Obviously, this fish is dying here. There's no world they would just hit my Kinnon when I'm on the least cards in the worst seat. But Malcolm was like, yeah, fuck that Kinnon. <laughs> <laughs> which, in his mindset, he was like, honestly, it, which I get his thought process. I'm not saying it was like 100% egregious or anything like that. I get his thought process, which he said was like, if he's tapping down his mana to pay for fish, and I'm playing all non, I'm playing like not non creature spells, so I don't really care about him drawing from fish because I'm not going to feed him when I'm trying to win soon. Like he thought his bigger risk was actually leaving me with the cannon and me doing something explosive, which I understand the thought process of, and is not what would have happened if he left my cannon around because my hand was booty hole. Um, which what I told him when he was thinking about redirecting Red Blast, I pointed at all my cards on the board and I was like, this was my mold of five. Like these were the cards, <laughs> which means the cards I have in hand are all just random. They're not something I kept the hand for, was the message I was trying to give there. Um, but he killed my cannon anyway. That was fine. We ended up a couple turns later. I finished like turn four, might have been turn five before he won with the One Ring and Seaborn Muse on board. So I was like, we cook in. We cook in. And then he tutored on end step and he got to Fairy Tom Rambler. And I was like, we are fucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sounds right. And, uh, sounds right. I, had, I, had a, <laughs> I had a Visage in hand and I was considering doing it with his tutor on the stack because he had a Relic of Legends. That was his best thing. And in my brain, I was like, let's see what he gets first. And he got to Fairy, and I was like, thank God it's a Viseju. And in my brain, I'm like, this hits a Gaia's Cradle if he goes for Derevi lines. This hits an Agatha Soul Cauldron if he tries to do stuff with that. Like, maybe it's okay. And I wonder if I shouldn't have said anything or not. I don't know if it would have changed the line, but I gave him some information. Because we were obviously, like, going to lose soon to Tim the Dargo or the Blue Farm. And when he untapped in his turn, I said, here's the, the deal, bro. I know you got the Teferi. I'm looking at your real talk. I got a piece of interaction for you. I'm not telling you what it is, but I'm letting you know right now it does work for what you have. If you cannot win, please don't go for it and please get rid of the Teferi. If you cannot win through this, please don't win. And in his brain, he knows it's Ottawa or Visage. Or Colossal Sky Turtle if he knows him on that. But like more, more realistically, Ottawa or Visage. 
Um, and so what he did was he actually came up with a line that pretty much got around both of them, <laughs> which was pretty hot. Uh, he went on a pretty sick line, ended up going infinite with, uh, he got Tyvar as his first thing. And then and then the, the real thing that, that, that did it, and the reason I didn't think he could win this turn with the revealed information, I did not have the knowledge that his literal last card in hand was Bloom Tender. He didn't show it. So he tutored up the Tyvar and then played the Bloom Tender, which was so hot. Um, and it really showed a level of piloting Sissei skill for Malcolm. I do not think a lot of Sissei pilots I'm used to playing would have like held back the Bloom Tender the way he did. He didn't want to show it. He wanted to look like he needed the Dark Side to be explosive, which I think was a very smart line that kind of took some scent off him. Um, so being able to hold back the Bloom Tender there, because if, if the Bloom Tender is revealed, we handle his deck differently. Right, you know what right. I mean? We are, way, we are way more aware of how quickly he can win. But leaving that in hand, tutoring with the fairy, then getting the tie bar, then playing the Bloom Tender safely, right. such a hot, such a hot line. Um, and he was able to go infinite with a meal and Bloom Tender to make infinite Sam's red at the time. And then um, I was like, oh, but the red, and he just like tapped the relic and like started blinking his other lenses. And I was like, that's hot, that's hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Good game, my guy. Good game. And I told him, I was like, I was like, would it have got you if I blew up the relic? Uh, on end step before you untapped, and he was like, that might have. Um, we thought through it a little bit, and we think he still could have gotten a line to get there. I think he said instead of Tyvar, he would have got Olivia, I forget if it's mobilized for, whichever one you can discard a card to give a creature haste, but that would have given him the color red so he could still give the Bloom Thunder haste. And then because the Bloom Thunder would have tapped for five, he could have gone on a different line than Derevi and instead, or a different line than Emil instead of could have gone to like Derevi next to unwrap right, it and right. then get Emil. And like that works from that position really, really well. So he still, I believe, could have got there. Um, but a really awesome win by Malcolm. Got to shove my words down my throat. I, I still think Sisei is not the best deck, but uh, it's a good deck, especially when it's piloted by a god to pilot. Yeah, you know what exactly, I mean? I also, exactly. I also, I also, I also like, like Malcolm is one of those guys. I think if I, if I handed him Kinnon, if I handed him Rock's if I handed him whatever, like he's going to do well. He's just best on Sisei. Yeah, I spent a lot of time talking to Malcolm, at, you know, after the tournament was over and just talking through Sisei a little bit with him. And, you know, his, his whole philosophy is, you know, he wants, he does not want to be interacted with. He builds the deck, builds his gameplay, builds everything around being ready for interaction, avoiding interaction, and it, it freaking pays off. Um, you know, and you put you put him, you know, in the deck that's built like that, and I don't, he's so damn hard to stop. He's just, just amazing. So, congrats, I, Malcolm. I went over, <laughs> I went over his list with him after the tournament. That is the spiciest Sissé deck I've ever seen. That maintains itself as a Sissé deck. We're gonna talk about Zach's list at some point, the Clan Chowder. Yeah. That is like a Sissé deck that's kind of just built like a Nazi Kenrith deck in a way. <laughs> um, but this one is like still pure Sissé. Like Malcolm's deck is a pure Sissé deck, but he's on like the spiciest removal for Oppo, the twin shot snipers. He's on some old split second two mana spell that does two damage to a creature. Like the dude is cooking. Yeah. The dude is outright cooking. Um, you know, he's got Gaia Drone Dihada in there right now, which can fucking like untap shit, give stuff haste. He tried to steal a Tevish at 11 with Gaia Drone Dihada, and the guy had to taint a pack for an Ottawara to remove his own Tevish. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's so awesome. That's so awesome. <laughs> like, this is good stuff. Wait, how was, how was your round two? Yeah, so my round two was um painful <laughs> uh pretty painful so i was on stream for for round two and i was playing against our good friend uh uh Deverick, uh who was in second seat on rock side and we had a italian in first seat in a blue f uh, blue farm it was a blue farm let me just stack joseph stacko it was yes blue farm uh in in fourth seat um and game started with a turn one italian out of jeffrey uh in first seat um that promptly got uh, killed swords um, before he even got back to his turn. So he wasn't drawing any cards off of that. Um, I got a pretty early Italian, not a crazy one, but I think around two or, or turn two Italian, I believe. Uh, started drawing cards nicely. I was getting great hits. I played like a Graft Digger's Cage to, to lock out um, um, uh, Deverick. Um, and Deverick got a really bad piece of luck on his turn one where he tried to uh, gamble for a Mystic Remora and I promptly sniped that right out of his hand and put it in the graveyard and smiled at him. It was great. <laughs> um, he, he cried the rest of the game, basically. Um, and then right after I got Talion in play, the Blue Farm player dropped a Drenith Magistrate. Um, and if you know how to play Talion, uh, this is pretty much the dream scenario. Uh, we've got the Talion player got shut out early. Uh, Deverick on, on Rogsai is basically doing nothing. He can't even get lands half the time. Um, and the, the Blue Farm player locked the rest of the board down with that, with that Drenith Magistrate. 
Um, and rounds continue. I keep drawing cards, nice pieces of interaction, and I drop a Shieldred um, right before the Blue Farm player plays a One Ring. And he's, you know, he's trying to work through it. He's taking lots of damage. Uh, at one point, he ends up cloning the Shieldred to protect himself, which uh, I'm fine with because it, uh, I've got... I do, I do that shit every time. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It's so good. I'm fine yeah. with that. Like, you, cool. We'll drain the table even faster now, uh, which is my game plan. And actually, your game plan is not to do that anyway. So uh, that works in my favor. Um, and also in my hand, I had a um, uh, Odawara the entire time. So at any point, I could easily remove... Uh, they had children, so I'm like, I'm cool. Let that, let, let the, uh, let those counters build up on the ring. Um, he's, you know, still losing life from from Italian triggers. And then at one point, uh, he tries to go for a win. His life total is pretty low, um, and he goes to tap the one ring. And at that point, I go ahead and Odawara the children. He takes a bunch of damage off the one ring and uh, goes down to like one life or two life. I don't remember. Um, it was a little lower than I wanted to be <laughs> um, because I don't want him to die because I don't want that Draneth gone, but you know, I can't let him win either. So cool. That's done. Um, Talion continues to do nothing, goes to Devrick's turn. Devrick swings out with his, <laughs> with, I think he just killed him with, um, <laughs> with Silas, I believe. He goes and he kills uh, the blue farm player, um, which gets rid of the Draneth. And at this point I begin to worry a little bit. Right, because Devrick is now un unshackled and ready to try to get there. Uh, so he starts going through iterations where he's putting potential wins on the stack over and over again. And I've got all the nut interaction to stop him. So I'm stopping him, I'm stopping him, I'm stopping him over and over and over again. I'm letting some spells resolve. Like at one point he puts a extra turn spell in the stack. Um, he put a born upon a win on the stack. I'm letting all that shit resolve because I know, you know, with that Graph Diggers in cage, Graph Diggers cage in play, I just have to interact it exactly, you know, certain places and not others to stop wins um but can you, uh, it, can you describe nut interaction to us <laughs> so i had like fluster storm i had mental misstep <laughs> i had force of will i had force in the i didn't have force of negation um i had a uh, trick bind in hand i had tashana's tide binder in hand like Mm -hmm. He he was not winning. I had an oppo agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. like yeah. he's just not getting there. It's just not going to happen. And 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 the way this is unfolding is Devrick is like, I played Born Upon to win. Would you like to draw? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no thanks. <laughs> he's like, okay, I played extra turn spell. Would you like to draw? Nope, nope. I think I'm good. Think I'm good. <laughs> and at one point he's down to like, I think he's at nine life. The Italian player is at twelve life. And he's like, I'll cast Wheel of Misfortune. And, I'll, and he's like, would you like to draw? <laughs> nope. <laughs> and then, so then I'm trying to talk the uh, the other Italian player into, like, I'm like, dude, you just need to say uh, eight life, right? Because if if uh, <laughs> if Devrick name, names nine life, he dies. So you just have to name enough life that he won't get to wheel, right? <laughs> did, you, did you still have Shieldred though? No, no, Shieldred got bounced. So Shieldred okay. was bounced. That's, a, that's important. That's yes. important. Yeah. Yeah. Shieldred got <laughs> bounced. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shieldred got bounced. And um <laughs> but I couldn't talk him into it. So, you know, Dever cast the wheel. Uh I name I, I'm like, I'm torn at this point because I've used up a lot of interaction. I still have Trick Bind and Tashana's in my hand, which felt pretty good. Um, but I'm pretty sure that I would rather get some more spells. Like, and you know, there's a lot of interaction still in my deck. So I pay 10 life to make sure I wheel. Um, and you know, the, the Italian player, despite my begging, uh, does not, he names zero. So Devra gets a wheel too. Okay. All right. This is fine. I'm still fine. This can't, how bad can a wheel be? Wheel was, uh, I believe it was five lands, <laughs> stern scolding and tainted pact. Uh, Yo, that's so good against rocks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's still a, exactly what you need. <laughs> but there's still there's still a graph digger's cage in play, so I'm not I'm not completely I'm not that worried still. Um, and he goes to his extra turn, and he I forget how he does it, but he goes and gets a uh, mnemonic betrayal. And mnemonic betrayal at that point is actually a problem, you know, because we're we're post wheel. I've got removal and good stuff in my graveyard. You know, he's going to be able to get around that graph digger's cage. There's a potential he actually manages to pull a win out here. Um, so he does some, some you know, goes to cast a Demonic Betrayal. I'm pretty sure at that point that's all he's got left. He's got two cards in hand at that point. Um, Did he offer the draw? He offered the draw again. Yeah, literally every <laughs> game action he took, he offered the draw. 
So I'm like, well, like, okay, I have a choice here. Um, is Stern Scolding going to be enough to stop this? I don't think so. Um, all right, I cast a Tainted Pact. Uh, and my goal at that point is to hold up the Stern Scolding um, so that in, just in case somehow he can go from a countered Mnemonic Betrayal for a Thassa's line, because at that point, that's his only way to win um, with the Graph Diggers. Um, I, so, I, so I go through my library, and it's, it's horrific Tainted Pact. I'm like exiling everything. Um, I finally hit a delay, and I'm like, I have two mana. If I use the delay, then I can't hold up the Stern Scolding. You know, there's got to be another counter spell here. I keep going. Even worse, goes deeper. I finally find a Force of uh, Negation. I cast it, pitching my Seagate Restoration, which is, I guess, that's one of the five lands. <laughs> um, and he stopped, and he dies. Right? I, on board at this point, I have a Wishclaw Talisman. Um, I have... Talion in play, almost everything is either an exile or in my graveyard. He's dead. The other Talion players at 12 life. Um, you know, this is gonna be a grinder. Like, how do I how do I just remove 12 life from him uh, before time runs out? Um, so I go to my turn, uh, I swing with Talion. I'm holding up that wish called Talisman. I'm thinking about like what can I get that ends this quickly? Like everything's gone. Orcish Bowmasters is gone, um, the one ring is gone, like like, I, I just don't have much left at this point to win. I just have to kill him. Um, so I, I take my swing. I go to pass the turn. And he flashes in a Holebreaker Horror. Right. And offers me the draw. And I'm looking at the board state. And I'm like, you know, is this does this stop me? Does this stop me? Like, can I just kill him? And I look down. And I've got the Wishclaw Talisman sitting there. And he's got a copy artifact on his board. A Chrome Mox and a bunch of lands. And I'm like, if he has any spell in hand at all, pretty much, this is a win for him, right? Because he can uh, cast that spell, bounce the uh, the copy artifact, replay it as a Wishclaw Talisman, go hit himself a zero mana rock, start a loop, and then from there, he can just use the Wishclaw Talisman again to win the game. But he doesn't see this at all. He has no idea that that win is on board. But I'm like, do I at this point accept the draw, you know, thinking that he's going to figure this out, or do I deny the draw and then hope that he's just going to miss the line? Um, and I sit there and I think about it for a minute, and finally I am forced to accept the draw because, you know, the likelihood is once he gets to his turn, he's going to sit there and think about it, and maybe he finds it. Uh, I talked to him after the game. I don't think he would have seen it. <laughs> uh, he, he did not see it at all, <laughs> at all, as it turns out. But uh, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did he ever tell you what he had in hand? Yeah, so he had a Yogwill in hand, um, which would have done the trick because he had a like a dark writ in his graveyard um, and a oh, few yeah, other spells. Right. So yeah, he definitely had yeah, it. He gets, he gets there, he gets there. Yeah, yeah, but tragic because I had such a, a lock on the board the entire game. Um, I'll put the link to that game in the description if people want to watch it. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy. So that was my round two. What about you for round three? My round three was. Sisse on the play, myself going second. My my turn order placement for this tournament was the best it has ever been, by the way, by an absolute mile. Uh, we had Hebrew Hercules, Kellen going third on Tevish Krom for a change, not Tim Nadargo, into uh, Blue Farm in fourth seat. Tell me I saw Blue Farm every fucking round. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, uh, this was a, a gameplay that is gonna give you PTSD. Um, I kept a hand that was Manglehorn on the play going second. My, my starting hand was literally, absolutely, this is not a joke, my hand was three lands, Elvish Spirit Guide, Soul Ring, Mental Misstep, Manglehorn. Which, I've said that hand to people, and they have said to me, why the fuck would you keep that? That doesn't do anything. And I said, in Manglehorn, I trust. That is how I usually will do that. And I mean, at a pod of Sisse, Evish Krom, and Blue Farm, Manglehorn is gas, dude. Manglehorn is so good there. And this is what I mean, where I think I think some players like really overestimate their need to have some kind of win line in hand from the start or some kind of path to victory from the start. If I have a hand that just like dunks on them with the right interaction, I trust. I trust. I've got patience. And uh, you know, that's what my perfect play pattern of the person in first seat goes turn one land mana rock, and I go turn two Manglehorn, baby. <laughs> Get rid of that mana rock. <laughs> and and every single time that happens, the person's just out of the game. Like every single time I do this, that person is just out of the fucking game. 
Um, and this one went well with it. I, I got lucky on some kind of flips for sure here. But like because of the soul ring, I was able to develop my mana pretty quickly. Um, I think on like turn three, I was like ready to start spinning or something like that with the mana rocks that grew as well. And first hit was Nezahal, second hit was Consphinx. Oof. Like it was just one of those. Consphinx carried this tournament, bro. Consphinx just absolutely fucking carried. Uh, and then yeah, we went we went supercharged Simic Smash. We won that game. And after the game, every single person at the table told me that if there wasn't a Mangohan on board, they could have won. And I said that is why I kept the hand. Yep. <laughs> That's just one of those. Makes sense. Makes sense. I even I remember I uh, I did one cannon activation. It wasn't actually pulled out of the whole cosmic. That that is what I ended up flipping into. I think my first flip was uh, Colossal Sky Turtle, and I literally looked at Kellen and I said, "Well, we got a Tavish player on the board," and I put it down. And he goes, "Fuck you!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my my round three was uh, I guess one of my favorite CDH players at this point, Eric Devoe. Uh, he's the guy who plays the the Blues Clues. So shout out to Eric, dude. Uh, every time we play, it's epic, absolutely epic, and this was no exception. Um, you know, on the play was a uh, Magda player who I think is um, kind of new to CDH, but like clearly has you know good skills, but is, is learning some things still. Um, and then we had Alex Liu, who I played, also played against him at top deck on Malcolm Kettis, uh, and then I was stuck in fourth seat. Um, and it was pretty much the nightmare start. Uh, Eric gets out a turn one Ristic study. Uh, I managed to get my turn one Talion into play, at which point on turn two he clones it with a <laughs> Phantasmal image. So now he's got a Rhystic Study and a Talion. Uh, proceeds to turn three where he plays a one ring. And at this point, I'm like, a a a table. Um, you see that guy over there? We have to work together to put pressure on him. Start getting rid of his draw engines. Put pressure on his life total. We got to do everything we can, or we're, he's just going to run away with the game completely. Um, and, you know, I'm able to convince the, you know, the, the Malcolm Kettis player, Alex, he clearly gets it right away. And we're, we're kind of working together. Um, the the um, Magda player was kind of, I think, just so beaten down at that point. Like he had played Magda. Um, he had an opportunity to attack with it, but didn't take it for whatever reason. Um, and then Magda was promptly killed by Lucas. Uh, so he was just kind of taken out of the game really early. And he just, you know, was kind of, you know, not sure what to do anymore. Meanwhile, Eric continues to develop. I'm doing everything I can to slow him down. Uh, I blow up his Phantasmal Image copy of Talion. That's one draw engine down. I play a Karn, uh, which locks out his one ring and he's taking damage off of it. And I'm swinging at him every single turn with my Talion, you know, trying to put damage on him as much as I can. His life total is dwindling. I'm like, you know, the only chance we have here is we, we could just get him low enough that he can't find a way to win. Um, but 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 meanwhile he's he's putting damage on Karn with 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 Lucas Pings. Uh, he plays a Mayhem Devil that he's using to ping down the Karn. I shut that down with the Tashana's Tidebinder. You know, just doing everything I can to keep him down. And I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and I'm trying. I'm begging, I'm begging the Magda player, please, please, please attack Eric. You gotta attack Eric. You gotta put pressure on him. And the Magda player is like, why? He's got plenty of life. We're never getting through this. Like there's no point in me Jeff, like risking my dwarves because <laughs> that's all he really had at that point, um, just to put a couple damage on him. Well, at the very end of the game, you know we're at the point where time is running out. I've managed to keep Eric from winning all this time with the help of the Malcolm Kettis player, and finally, you know he's like, look, it's like going to be the last turn of the game. He finds a way to get rid of the Karn. He finds a way to go for the win. I have a Blood Chief's Ascension, by the way, online at this point, draining him. And he's at, I think, seven life. And he finds a line to win with one life left. And if if only that Magda player had swung even one time, even one more time, um, Eric doesn't win there and ends up being a draw. But Eric wins it. Kudos to Eric. He found a, you know, found a way through the, the muck to get there. You know, really great job. Dude, dude is like... You know, talk about god tier pilots like that's eric man. eric's yeah eric's a good fucking magic player dude i, I really like eric eric's a hell of a good dude too yeah he's a pleasure to play with too like he like he he does not fuck around like he does not make mistakes he's just you know on he's friendly he's fun to play with you know just kudos mm -hmm. to eric man good job congrats that on the thick, win <laughs> that thick beard bro that uh, thick beard well, that's a, i gotta get back to that i'm falling behind dude. it's a it, honestly it's a distraction because i kind of want to run my fingers through it like the whole match <laughs> i just want to play with it <laughs> it's so yeah, nice yeah i i gave him i gave him the tickle 
So yeah, uh, yeah, kudos to Eric. Good win, good win, dude. Uh, what about your round four? Round four, I got to be on the play. Like on the play, let's go. Uh, myself on Canon and first seat, we had Caveman, who I just was in the top four against in uh, in, in Chaos, um, in second seat, and then we had Godo in third seat and Magda in fourth seat. And I, I joked with Caveman a little bit at the start of the game. I said, please don't hail Mary a wheel. He said, no worries, no worries. <laughs> um, and then I did tell him, I said, look at this pod. I'm begging you, mull for oppo. <laughs> please, <laughs> for the love of God, get an oppo on this board. Because like, whatever, it shows off some of my tutors. I don't care. I don't need, I, I, I can like live without the oppo. I can like, I can, I can fight through an oppo. That's fine. I don't have that many tutors in my deck. But like, Godo cannot win through oppo. Magda cannot win through Oppo. Like, please, please get this Oppo on board. And he did come through. He like Vampiric tutored on turn two and and, and like totally got an Oppo. Um, uh, at which point he eventually cast the Oppo, and in response to the Oppo, I worldly tutored. Um, and in my hand, I had a basalt monolith. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I was like, looks like a grindy game. I'll put a Thrasios on top. <laughs> God, you're that guy. You did it. Nah, 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 nah. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. What ends up happening though yep. is the following turn. I play Basalt, and I have to use enough interaction that I cannot cast the Thrasios from my hand. That option doesn't exist um, because I, I I end up tapping out of colored mana in the interaction battle over the Basalt, so I can no longer win that turn, and that's fine. So what I ended up doing after doing a lot of mouth and math and calculations and seeing if there was anything I can do. I end up playing my Phyrexian Metamorph as a copy of Chrome Mox because that was the only fucking mana rock on the board. Pitch a blue card for my hand, I don't remember what it was, and then tap the Chrome Mox for two blue and play a Neza Hall. I say let's vibe. And then what ends up happening is Caveman untaps and goes to just throw out a wheel. <laughs> uh, to which, what was funny, what had happened the turn before, by the way, the... Um, this is important because I, I knew this information from the previous Godo player's turn. He went to play a Treasonous Soaker and was like, I just need blockers. And I was like, but if you get rid of Oppo, you just win. Um, and and Caveman ended up having the Mind Break Trap for the Treasonous Soaker. And, and, you know, he had Deflecting Swat. That was, so he had two cards left in hand at that point. So Deflecting Swat puts him down to one card left in hand. And I'm looking at it and like, I have a dispel I can use here. I didn't want to use my mana drain yet. And like, I was like, you're really just trying to get blockers? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, can I see your last card in hand? He goes, absolutely. And he, and he tosses it over to me and it's a wheel of fortune. And I'm like, are you just gonna fucking send this wheel? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, dispel, fuck what? No, <laughs> like, like, I'm not having you just fucking wheel with the trees and stuff, I'll get out of here. But also my Thrasios and Basalt were both in hand at this point. So I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and I, and I, and I did, which like revealing information, a great thing when that information is going to lead to you happening, what you want to happen. Right. But obviously there's no world of letting you send a wheel there with the trees and stuff around. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I, I counter that. And then, but so going back to my turn and going to Caveman's turn where Caveman shows the wheel, I say, hold up, this dude's about to just wheel next turn. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. cause I, I, I'm like, don't, I'm like his last, his last card's a wheel. Like don't send a wheel right now and let him go into his turn with a full grip, make him use the main on a wheel. Right. And he's like, that, that makes sense. So he just passes over to, uh, to the next guy and he, he wheels. Um, and, uh, what ends up happening? Oh, which really important thing, uh, the, the Magda player tried to get rid of the Oppo and my Kinnon with the Basalt on the stack with a like Pyrokinesis. And I, that was what I had to use my mana drain That's on. hot. And so <laughs> I also, That's a hot play though. Was uh, he? It was literally, the dude had two cards in hand. And I was like, as long as Magda doesn't have their weird free removal of safe. I literally thought that because yeah. everyone was tapped out too. I was literally like, as long as Magda doesn't have weird red free removal, I'm fine. And he had the weird red free removal. I was kind of pissed. Uh, and so, yeah, but so he, he fires off the wheel, wheel goes through. My, my Thrasios is in the yard, which I'm able to politic here. I'm like, my Thrasios is gone, good sir. Yeah. Um, like, not I, dangerous I no anymore. Longer, you guys are fine. I no longer, I no longer have a deterministic, okay. I no longer have a deterministic kill here. There's just a there's just a basalt just chilling. You know what I mean? It's just oh, a kid of basalt. Wrong. It's hanging. fine. I'm tapped out. I'm tapped out. There's a kid of basalt right there. I'm like, whatever, whatever. Um, but what ends up happening is and there's there was a Dranith on board as well. So so caveman, he has an oppo and he has a Dranith. 
And so obviously if my cannon dies, like I can't get cannon back right now. That's actually like a problem. And what ends up happening on Magda's turn is he can't Magda, win you mean Godo, right? This. Godo's turn? I mean, no, Magda. Because oh. Godo, then Magda, then me. Okay, okay. So on Magda's turn... Do you yeah, have Magda Godo and Godo in the same pod? Holy shit. Okay. Same fucking pod. That was why I was like, Mo for Uppo. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Mo for Uppo. But so what Magda ends up doing is they end up having to use like all of their treasures um, and and like use all their mana to just fire off a sorcery speed. I think it's called Mizium Mortars, the four damage to all your opponent's creatures. Yep. And so he can't win that turn after he does it. And he's very clear about that. He's like, I just have to do this to have a chance on the next turn. And I'm like, okay, like it gets rid of Kinnon, which sucks, but it also gets rid of Drana. Right. And Oppo. And my wheel happened to have like, I don't know, a Tezzeret in it and stuff. So. <laughs> So, so what ends up happening here? So my, is, yeah, just, to, just, to, just, to, just to be clear, okay. So, <laughs> so my wheel had five lands, a tainted pact, and a stern scolding, and your wheel had. My wheel was like Tezzeret, endurance, a couple pieces of interaction. Go on. Yeah. Go so on. I had tap on my turn. I had tap on my turn. And I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna replay this cannon. You know what I mean? Uh, and then I go infinite, and then I play a Tezzeret, and I think they try and counter the Tezzeret, and I say nope, and then the Tezzeret lands, and then what happens is I minus zero the Tezzeret. Oh, by the way, Magda had an unlicensed curse here as well, and I'm looking at my Thrasios in the graveyard, and I have the Endurance in hand. Like, please don't and take so it. So I, min <laughs> I minus zero, well, I have the Endurance. So I minus zero the Tezzeret, yep. and I put Treasure Vault into play, which by the way, everyone who gets Mirage Mirror first, don't do that. Get, just get Treasure Vault. <laughs> Because uh, it's so much harder to interact with if they have something. So I minus zero. I get treasure vault. I sack the treasure vault. The trigger of treasure vault on the stack. He goes, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna tap the unlicensed creature. Would like to exile your Gracios. And I go, that's so cool. Here's an endurance. And he just literally goes, you had the fucking endurance. <laughs> and they immediately scoop it up because they know I have it there. Um, yeah. So we nice. We got there. Nice. At that point, we're we're three and one. We're at 15 points going in around five. We're feeling super fucking good, dude. We're feeling super good at three and one. Really happy with it. Um, and yeah, how was your how was your round four? Yeah, so I'm I'm going into round four. I'm one one and one at this point, and I get paired up against uh, Manila Midget uh, Sean uh, on his famous Dargo and Thrasios deck. That he was very keen to point out that I I team, ranked Teamer Necro. I'm sorry, what? He calls it Teamer Necro. He calls it now. Teamer Necro. Okay, Teamer Necro. <laughs> but he was very he was very very uh, uh, eager to point out how low I ranked it and 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 point out how how that was incorrect and and uh you know I, i'm sorry sean i'm sorry but you know you know the game he, he wasn't mad about how low you ranked it he was mad that if you which by the way i didn't yes. say shit this is 100 yeah, yeah, yeah. on you yeah, 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 he yeah. was mad that when you were talking about it all you said was it's premier pilot freedom waffle right. no longer is playing the strategy it's best pilot it's only champion is no longer playing the deck and manila's there like bruh <laughs> like, like yeah, yeah i yeah, won yeah. on this deck yeah, yeah, yeah. i won on this deck first <laughs> like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. By, by the way this is, this is the first time i met sean in person great guy man great Love guy sean. one of the most fun people to play with ever um <laughs> so i genuinely feel bad because he is a badass pilot um but i did dunk on him sean in this is, game completely I, I, this was not one of our games but i am i am talking about sean's round seven 100 percent. yeah i'm not not i'm not not talking about that yeah it was the most base shit i've ever seen in my fucking life <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so this game uh, i just totally dunked on him but you know i have to i have to give credit to the luck gods because my hand was fucking ridiculous it's like the hand that you dream about like like before you go in a, in a tournament, like, man, if I could just get one of those hands, how great would that be? It was, um, I, I don't remember all the specific cards, um, but know that it was a, like Land, Jeweled Lotus, uh, Mox Amber, uh, Mystic Remora, Blood Chief's Ascension. Okay, and then other cards. <laughs> so I go, and I'm on the play. I'm on the play. So I go, I go, and, I, and I'm playing against, okay, in second seat, we've got uh, um, Derevi. In third seat, we've got Crick again, and then we've got Sean in fourth seat, poor Sean. Um, so I'm like, all right, I'm playing against Crick. I am not going to take this amazing hand, tap everything, pass the turn, and have Crick just win on turn one. I'm not doing that. So I go I go turn one, I play my Talion, I drop my Mox Amber, and I hold up, a, a, oh, that's right, I had a swan song. So I hold up a swan song, because I'm not gonna give up, I'm not gonna pass the turn with no interaction. So I hold off on casting my fish, and I hold off on casting my Blood Chief's Ascension, um, and you know, pass the turn. Uh, Derevi develops a little bit, Crick 
Uh, doesn't do a whole lot. I think he just played like a, a mana vault, I, right? I would have played the fish. I would have played the fish. Nah, fuck that. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna blow that hand, dude. How horrible would it be if I? If, play the fish though. The fish draw you so many cards when crit goes for it. Yeah. Well, in any case, he didn't go for it. He played the mana vault. He passed. Sean did some things. I got back to my turn. I dropped the fish. I dropped the the, the blood chief's ascension. I smile and I pass. And then I just start drawing cards, right? Drevi, um, pull. Oh, Show the viewers. Show the viewers the smile. Yeah. What mm. what smile did you have? You just... <laughs> oh my I was God. so happy, dude. I was so happy. <laughs> have you played a fish and made that fucking face at me? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So 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 I, I start drawing cards. I think Drevi at that point. I think he played uh, Adrenith, I believe. I don't remember what he played. He, no, no, no. He played a, a collector oof. He played a collector oof, and I'm like, cool, you know, because at that point in my hand, I had drawn a deadly relic, right? So I got a deadly relic in hand. I've got a yeah. You know, yes, my my. I have a bunch of artifacts in play, but I don't care. I'm I can I can kill that oof whenever I need to, uh, if, if for whatever reason I do. Um, Crick promptly like he plays the Crick. I draw a card off the Crick. He tries to do some things. He loses a whole bunch of life. Oh. My Blood Chief's Ascension goes on real quick, and the table just starts dying. Um, how did you uh, How did you draw a card from Crick B? Oh, it's a 2-2. Two -two. It is a 2-2. Two -two. That is correct. It's a 2-2. Two -two. I always two -two. forget it's a 2-2. Two -two. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So everyone's pretty locked out, feeling good, like drawing cards, um, you know, draining people out. Derevi's trying to do some things, uh, you know, but can't really do much. Um, you know, at, at one point, um, Derevi plays a Cutsel, plays a Cutsel, uh, and passes and at that point I'm like you know okay all right I should probably stop monkeying around now and try to win the game um, but things are you know things have developed like I'm leaving a lot of little little details out you know because it's just too much to explain but I'll explain my board state um, so at this point in the game as it's coming back around to my turn uh, Sean is pretty locked out can't do a whole lot he has some mana he has like three or four cards in hand uh, Derevi tapped out to play the Cutsel. Um, uh, I have an opposition agent in play. I know what's in Derevi's hand. Uh, I know that he has a worldly tutor. Um, I know that he has basically nothing else and he's tapped out. Um, I have looked at, at uh, Crick's hand. I know that Crick's not a problem. Uh, and Crick actually dies, I think, on that turn rotation anyway. So he's out of the game. Uh, so the only thing I really have to worry about is Sean because he has like, I don't know what he has and he has three cards. I have Italian on two. I have a uh, Sakashima the Imposter as Italian on one. I have a fish. I have uh, a turned on Blood Chief's Ascension. Like, I have everything. And in my hand, I have Beseech the Mirror, and I have Demonic Consultation, and a bunch of, uh, and like, two pieces of interaction. Right? So I'm like, all right, I think I should stop monkeying around now and actually win the game. Uh, so I get back to my turn, and I'm looking at my hand, and I'm like, um, you know, what's the easiest way for me to win? And this is this is on Sean's end step before my turn. I'm like, what should I do? I have a mystical tutor. I can go tutor for something. You know, how do I win the game here with 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 Beseech the Mirror and um and a and a mystical tutor? Like this should be easy. Um, but there's a little bit of a problem, and that is I have two not one, but two Italians in play. Uh on one and on two. So if I go for a Thassa's Oracle line and anybody at the table manages to cast a one drop or a two drop. Well, in this case, I'm just worried about Sean. But if he manages to cast a one drop or a two drop here, in response, I just die. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go tutor for a time twister. And then I'm going to try to beseech the mirror for a shieldred and see if I can just, or shieldred or, or a bowmaster, and see if I can figure out a way to win with, with just damaging everyone to death. Um, that's a misplay on my part. I. You know, there wasn't enough damage to do that. Wasn't enough damage to finish. Uh, all I really had to do there was go get a uh, Toxic Deluge to wipe the board and then win. Um, but instead, I, I got this Time Twister. I go to my turn and immediately realize, whoops, that doesn't work. But, you know, do I just send it now? Like, do I just do it? Do I just go get the Thassa's Oracle and and put the Demonic Consultation on the, on the, on the stack and, let, and just hold out hope that, to the gods that Sean doesn't have a one or a two drop to cast? Hmm... Hmm. Fuck it. We ball. How, how long? How long would you say you sat on this decision? It was like ten minutes. Like ten minutes. <laughs> I'm sitting there. You would have got. You would have got slow play called on you so fast if there's a judge nearby. Dude, dude. I'm. I'm like. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, 
oh, do I do this? Do I do this? Do this? And finally, I'm like, fuck it, we ball. I, <laughs> I cast the Beseech the Mirror, put Thassa's Circle on the stack, put, you know, Demonic Consultation, and everyone's like, yep. Good game. And that was it. My one. <laughs> but, oh, man, I was sweating. So sweating. But, you know, we got there. We got there. You got there. You got, dude, sometimes fuck a wee ball just does it. Make them have it. That's what we have to do. Have to make get it. there. Make them yeah. fucking have it. Yeah, stop fucking around and go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Give it a shot. Yeah. So feeling what good about, now. Uh, feeling good. Now yeah. I'm 2 1. Now I'm 2 1 1 going into round five. As yeah, you you're at 11. So I was 15 points. So I was in that, that, you know, like top few guys. Um, my pod ended up being uh, myself, Eric DeVoe, uh, Zach, another guy from that Massachusetts crew on the Clam Chatter Sisse, and Jacoby. Um, all of us, at, I think me, me, Eric, and Zach were all at 15, and Jacoby was at 16. Um, and immediately all three of them are like, we ID here, right? And I go, no, I'm on the play. <laughs> like, Sorry, my guys. <laughs> and I say very clearly, I'm like, look, I would like to start the game where 100% I'm not going to ID before I look at mulligans or anything. Like, if we want to ID after mulligans or we want to have that conversation at a midpoint in the game, like, all of those things are options. We can ID at any point. But let's stop talking about this draw pregame because it's not happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we are the stream. And because we said we're playing, they're like, cool, you guys are the stream game. So I'm like, sick. Uh, ends up that I'm all to a super shitty five. And so I say pregame, I'm like, would you guys like to draw? <laughs> and at that point, and at that, at that point, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. And, and at that point, they were like, no, <laughs> let's, let's play. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no worries, all good. But again, I wasn't like pushing at it at all. And like they were, they got like kind of mad when I asked. I was like, look, I asked a question, you answered. I have no complaints. I'm not going to push this. That's fine. Let's play. And so we start off the game, and um, you know, Sissa gets, Sissa gets off to a pretty quick start. Jacoby starts developing pretty quickly. Ends up with a ranger captain on board. Eric ends up, you know, devoting some resources to stopping Sisse. Very notably, I was even saying, like, going into Sisse's turn, where, like, I could see the line for obvious wins. And I didn't realize Zach's list was less Sisse-focused and much more, like, breach meme bet type stuff focused. Like, he has those combos. He has the Oracle and that kind of shit. Um, that's yep. why it's, like, more explosive five-color Sisse. With Sisse, is like, A plan, but not B plan. You know what I mean? But I was looking at it with, like, Lotho on board and all these things that help with the Sisse colors. And I'm like, look, like, if you... I literally listen to Eric. I'm like, if you have a Bowmaster in hand, I recommend you play it and you get rid of that Lotho. And he was like, that is exactly what I'm doing. And so he plays the Bowmaster, gets rid of the Lotho. You know, the game continues a little bit. I um I, I end up in a situation where I've got like I've got Kinnon, I've got a Springleaf drum, I've got three lands on my on my like turn turn four or whatever. And the hand I kept was literally, it was like two lands, springleaf drum, uh uh transmute artifact. It was like pretty much the hand I kept. It might have been three lands, springleaf drum, transmute artifact. Because I was like, let's just hope we can snipe a Basalt win, maybe. But at this point in the game, I'm like, I have not drawn anything that works with Basalt. I'm like, that is clearly not going to be happening. I think I just drew, like, Counter Magic. Yeah, yeah, I think my hand was, like, Fierce and Fluster and stuff. And so I go, like, all right. Um, there, uh, and at this point, there's a, there's about to be a second Ranger Captain on the board as well. I don't remember if this was before or after the second Ranger Captain. But when, when Eric casts a Metamorph that is obviously going to come in as a second Ranger Captain, he offers the draw. Uh, which was a very big thing and we had a discussion about it and we agreed on the draw on the premise that we would still play it out for the stream like a real game um which there were definitely some decisions that were made that people said like yeah i might have not done that if, if it wasn't if it wasn't already a draw um but it was still it was a good game and so yeah we already agreed on a draw but at this point i i tap the spring leaf draw my cast transmute artifact and i say very clearly i'm not going for basalt here don't worry and they're like, what are you getting? And one of the guys is like, he said he wants some cards. He's probably getting the Wondering. I was like, I'm 100% getting the Wondering. And I mean, looking at your guys' boards with fucking like Espers and Bowmasters and shit, if you really want to counter this, like fucking feel free. Uh, I don't care. And so they didn't. And I, I sack the Spring of Drum. I tap all my lands. I get a uh, I get a Wondering on the board. And then I play my land for turn, which is Manamo. <laughs> always, <laughs> always throw out the Wondering before. Always throw out the wondering before you play the Manamo, for the record. Oh, yeah. um, oh, yeah. it's a little it's a little scarier if you already have the Manamo. Yep. And Eric is immediately like, You're gonna grind back and win this fucking thing. I can feel it. And I'm like, nah, there's no way. There's no way. And I'm sitting there for turns where I have zero mana rocks on board. I have four lands of wondering and kinnon. And there's bowmasters. And it ends up that um that uh, Zach gilded drakes the bowmasters. 
And, you know, he was like looking at the cannon and I was even like, take the cannon, bro. You want it's going to die to the Bowmasters when I tap my one rank. And he's like, yeah, that's true. So he takes the Bowmasters and I'm like, cool. And then the entire time I'm sitting there with like just a couple of cards in hand and there's Bowmaster triggers happening. And I'm like, you can hit the cannon if you want. I have zero mana rocks and zero dorks on board and I have nothing in my hand that works with cannon. Go fucking, I don't care if you hit cannon. And he's like, I believe you. So he's picking off like Ragavans and Espers and stuff instead, which was like, act, like if you could see my hand, objectively the correct thing to do. Like I know a lot of people are like, kill the Kinnon no matter what, but I, I did not have a single Mana Rock in hand. I did not have a single Mana Dork in hand. I did not have a single Assault Tutor in hand. And I had Kinnon. none of those things on the board. Kill the Fuck Kinnon. Off. I, I know the, the Kinnon kill literally it. didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't care about the Kinnon. Still um, but what ends up happening is like, uh, we go to the turn cycle. I'm able to like tap and untap the Wondering again. I end up doing a deal before Jacoby's turn where he's just had this Ranger Captain the whole time. And like every single turn cycle, he's saying like, I'm not winning with it. Don't worry yet. Um, but before this next turn, I was like, I'm a little, I'm a little sketched out about the Ranger Captain. So like what I will offer is, I, cause I was holding up interaction with my two mana, which was Manamo and a land at this point. And, and I said, I was like, if you want, Zach, I can untap my Wondering and I can tap it for three right now and that will kill the Ranger Captain if you're worried about Jacoby winning. And he goes, I'm actually down with that. So I so I do that. I tap out of my interaction to get rid of the Ranger Captain. Um, Make a deal with the devil. And, uh, ah, that's whatever. <laughs> and, then, uh, and, then, and, then, and then on Jacoby's turn, this is really interesting. Jacoby, he plays an imposter deck as a copy of Bowmasters. Very importantly, which by the way, I also have a Ristic study at this point. I have a Wondering and a Ristic. Um, and so uh, he hits the other Ranger Captain. And like my Ristic draws hits the other Ranger Captain. They also at some point like did kill my cannon before my turn. Um, but at this point I'm untapping where like I drew a bunch of cards on Ristic as well. And then, so I've got like, like 10 cards in hand. But again, they're like, oh, he's just going to win. And I'm like, I've got like, I think I literally only have five like my when when i go to my turn i have the one ring i have ristic study and i have five lands on board not a single mana rock not a single rock. um and i go okay and i top deck for turn and i and i draw cards for the turn and it gets me basalt and i'm like all right cool so i so i play a land um i pay four for kinnon i tap one i play soul ring and a lot of interaction has been like used at this point i pay one for soul ring and then so all i have is soul ring and one color dip i tap soul ring i play the soul <laughs> No one has anything for Basalt. And I'm like, cool, 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 cool. Um, and then when I when I go to tap the Basalt with the untapped trigger on the stack, uh, Jacoby tries to chain a vapor. That's cool. Here's a Fierce Guardianship. Um, get that, and now I know that they're spent. And so I tap my Soul Ring for Basalt. I make infinite colors, and with my last remaining mana, I cast Greed Sun Zenith. And I get Thrasios into play with infinite colorless mana in the mana pool. And of course, they are not scooping here because I am at eight life <laughs> at this point, and there is an imposter mech bowmasters and a real bowmasters, and so they're like, I don't think you can win this game. And my emergent zone, by the way, is on the battlefield tapped, mm. so it's not like they're not like in the brand like you can't crop rot into E zone like that's not an option. So they're like, I don't think he can win here on just colorless mana. Um, so they're like, let's play it out. So I'm like, cool, activate Thrasios. Okay, draw this card, Bowmaster Triggers. You'd like to ping of me. Okay, I'm going to respond on top of those. Can we just assume that as I'm doing this, you're gonna have enough triggers that murder me and everything on my board as I go through this? And they were like, that sounds good. I was like, cool. So I keep activating Thrasios on top of everything. I go like literally probably 50 cards deep until I finally hit Elvish Spirit Guide, Crop Rotation, and a bunch of Counter Magic. And so then I uh, exile Elvish Spirit Guide. I Crop Rotation, sacrificing the Emergent Zone to put that shit in the graveyard go and get Treasure Vault that I put on the bottom with the Thrasios Scries, crack the Treasure Vault, make infinite treasures, activate Kinnon, put Spellskite into play, redirect all Bowmaster triggers to Spellskite, still responding on top of it for funsies, cast Endurance from hand, put Crop Rot and the E-Zone back in the library, reactivate Thrasios to get the Crop Rot, to then Crop Rot into E-Zone, crack the E-Zone, play everything, bounce all their permanents, make all my shit infinite power, redirect everything to the Spellskite once again, just to be double Easter, and then go to combat and kill them. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Fuck your Bowmaster. Everyone thinks I can't win through a <laughs> I can win through a fucking Bowmaster. That shit is easy mode. Nice. Uh, nice. That's epic. <laughs> but that was a gas line. It was, it was cool. One of the guys that actually coached on Kinnon was standing right behind me watching the whole thing. And I turned around after the game and he goes, I just nutted watching that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, Absolutely wow. Yeah, that, so that, that one felt good. Glad, glad that one was on the stream. I had a couple of the guys I've been playing with locally around here. They even messaged me and they were like, that was, that was sick. That was sick. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was good. Well, so we, we we ended up, we took the ID. So I finished day one at 16 points. 
annoyingly, I might have been at 20 points, but that's okay. That happens. Um, how was your round five? Yeah, it was a nightmare pod for me. Um, so I was playing against Dallas Glaze in first seat uh, on his Team or Pirates deck. Um, he actually offered a draw at the beginning of the round that like, I thought for a second about taking just because of how bad the pod composition was against me. Um, so because in second seat, we have Naya Minsk. Yeah, I said that. Naya Minsk in second seat, myself in third seat, and then in fourth seat, Slicer. So I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to suck. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, before we do anything, um, you know, we need to talk about Slicer. And I get interrupted. Judges come over. You're getting deck checked. I'm like, perfect. Perfect. So they, they take our decks. They go off to their little corner. They start working through our decks. We're sitting around hanging out. You know, 15 minutes goes by approximately. They bring back my deck and they're like, whose deck is this? And I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh, what happened? They're like, yeah, that's mine. I have a split sleeve. Okay, and I left my spare sleeves in the Airbnb. So like, yep, yeah, you're gonna need to resleeve your whole deck. So at that point, I jump up, I run to one of the many vendors that are in this, uh, the, the, in the, the, uh, the center there, Charlie's Collectible Card Show, which is, they had everything there, by the way. So finding a vendor with sleeves is not a problem. However, they don't have my preferred sleeves, so I had to get some fresh uh, dragon shields. And if you've ever had, what are what are, what are your preferred sleeves? Uh, KMC Hyper Phoenix is what I prefer with KMC uh, Perfect Hard Inners. Um, so, in any case, I have to then sit there with the judges, unsleeve my whole deck, put on these brand new, super slippery as fuck dragon shields. Um, shuffle my deck and then try to like get my mind right again and get into the game. Um, I was pretty jilted, not gonna lie. Um, threw me off. Um, I played a, a little bit worse than I think I would have. I actually missed uh, two Italian triggers in the game, uh, which were key. Uh, you know, one of them being a spell pierce, the other being a delay, uh, as it turns out. Uh, but in any case, we uh, we shuffle up and play. I, I sit down, I'm like, listen, guys, do you know how Slicer works? <laughs> because let me tell you, uh, when you get into a pod that doesn't know how slicers work, you just die, right? But, you get dunked on. Yeah, you get absolutely dunked on. Yeah, you 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 know you cannot afford to be greedy against slicer. You need to sit down and work as a team and shut slicer off. Uh, and then once slicer shut off, you can play your regular game. But if you leave slicer alone, you die. Um, so we go into the game. You know, everyone sort of understands that, um, and. Slicer just pushes over and over and over again. I stopped it, I think, three times. Uh, Team or Pirates stopped them one time. Um, and then the the Minsk player who, like, you know, really young guy, um, you know, I don't mean offense when I say, you know, he looked like a, a young kid to me. And I'm 45. He must have been you know, maybe 20. I don't know. Uh, young guy. Um, like, misread uh, Reprieve. You know, he had Reprieve in his hand. Um, and he misread Reprieve as saying bounce a creature that was already on the battlefield. He didn't understand that it's it's a, you, know, you hit a spell on the stack, not something that's already in play. Um, and he actually ended up like sacking a Lotus Petal to do to, to try to cast the spell uh, before realizing it, it can't do anything. Um, so pretty, pretty rough misplay on his part. You know, new guy, like no, like I, I'm not trying to disparage him at all. Like, and we talked after the game and he understood that, you know, there was a mis big misplay. You know, we all punt from time to time. That was his punt, you know. Um, but in any case, that really took him out of the game. He wasn't able to do anything else. So at that point, it was just, uh, you know, me, <laughs> Team or Pirates, and Slicer. So Slicer made another push. Um, at that point, I had a Force of Will in my hand, um, but that was the only interaction I had. Um, on his next push, I missed Italian Trigger. Um, but fortunately, the team of pirates player had a lightning bolt, killed the uh, killed the slicer. Goes to his turn. Um, he goes and you know, before his turn, I ask him like as he's going to his turn, as slicer's coming down, I'm looking at the force of will. I'm looking at him and I'm like, dude, are you about to win on your turn? Do you have the win? Is that what you're doing? Are you about to win? You know, trying to get a read on him. Like you don't have to answer me when I ask that question, but I'm really poking at him, trying to get a, an idea of whether or not I should use this force of will on the slicer or not. Um, and he's like, nah, I don't have a win. I don't have a win. I don't have a win. And I'm like, I just don't, I don't know that I really believe you, Dallas. I don't know. Um, I'm going to make you deal with this slicer. You know, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm not going to do anything. So, um, I let slicer resolve and then he lightning bolts it goes to his turn. Uh, immediately draws a card, casts, uh, uh, Glenhorn Buccaneer. 
And I'm like, oh, man, you didn't have the win in hand. Come on, dude. Um, clearly had it. Plays the, the, the Glenhorn uh, Buccaneer. I missed the... Wait, did, did, he, did he say if he, like, top decked it or anything? Oh, he had it in his opener. They had it the whole time. Oh, so so he did just straight out lie. Yeah, he lied, but that's okay. I mean, you could do uh, that. It's yeah. a tournament, you know. It's not. Sure. I don't recommend it. I won't believe him next time. <laughs> not not how I choose to play. Not what I appreciate. Yeah. But I get it. Yeah, but in any case, he he dropped that that Glenhorn Buccaneer. Um, I missed the Italian trigger again. Again, my head's just not quite right. Um, and I cast the Force of Will. Uh, and he has he has another piece of counter magic in his hand, uh, but he had no mana left at that point. If I had drawn i would have drawn a spell pierce which would have stopped him and i had a delay after that that i also could have cast so i just punted myself by missing uh missing my italian triggers uh, and he won the game so pretty rough way to end round five you know jilted sleeves that i don't like uh slippery as fuck you know and a big loss <laughs> so a little bit sad going back to the airbnb but i'm still alive right i'm still at 11 points you know, win and, and a draw puts me in contention. Two wins is a lock, so I'm not out. So that was the end of day one for me. So uh, that night, we all went back to the Airbnb, and we took Jaeger yeah. bombs and played Magic all night. <laughs> uh, it was cool because a comedian actually uh, played my Italian deck all night. I played my Florian deck, and we had a blast. Just a great time, great time among all. I, I built a vintage cube deck that was Abzan Tempo. I know I went to the Abzan color range, a place that I hate. Um, but then I then I then I got it past the fucking time walk in my Abzan deck, and I was like, I'm gonna take it. And I'm gonna run it. And I had no blue sources in that deck. The only feasible way for me to cast time walk was playing a land with my Lotus Cobra on the battlefield. <laughs> And I successfully cast that time walk almost every single game. Because <laughs> I would just hold it. I would just hold it till I drew Lotus, Lotus Cobra. And then I'd be like, LOL, time walk. <laughs> so funny. So funny. Cube is, cube is awesome. Cube yeah. is really fun. We did a lot of vintage cube this weekend. Dude, that house was, was, that house was stacked with great people. Just absolutely stacked. I mean. Dude, I'm just mad. Why? Fucking Gmet Because Geometrius, this fucking guy. Like, really nice guy. Nothing actually personally against him. But, but my, I don't have MTGO. But my experience with Vintage Cube is watching Waffle and Manila just stream it when I'm falling to bed, falling asleep at night. So that's my experience with Vintage Cube. And so I don't get to, I don't actually get to play that much. And so I'm here, I finally get to play Vintage Cube. And I fucking get past a pack that has Breach and Braid Freeze in it, and I already have Black Lotus. And I'm like, LOL, perfect. I'll take this Breach. No one's ever going to take this Brain Freeze. And so Geometris, for no reason, he was like, yeah, I just took the Brain Freeze to cut somebody. And I was like, bro, you don't understand. I understand that that is competitively <laughs> correct, but I I do not get to do this very often. And I was trying to live the dream. And so if you could not fucking do that, that'd be great. Good job, Gio. Because then also the next couple packs on the next fucking open, like dude, that was pack two on pack three, I got past LED. I got past Thassa's Horrible. I got past Yogsville. I would have had literally everything. I would have had the absolute fucking schnutz. One time, I would have gotten to live the dream in Cube, and he took the brain freeze and took it away from me, and I was really sad about it. It's hilarious. It's <laughs> hilarious. It's but instead, I was just like, I had Emery and Black Lotus, and I was just hard casting con sphinxes and shit, taking extra turns. Damn. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a great time all around. It was it was a blast. And, and going into day two, uh, we, I wouldn't say we were well rested. We were tired as fuck, but... But no sleep. Yeah, but we we went to Angie's and we got our got our delicious eggs and bacon and biscuits and you know monsters and we were good to go. Going into day oh, two. So dude, Mo Monster Energy should literally be renamed Sleep in a Can. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So <laughs> you makes me feel so good. So you didn't need to win again, right? I mean, you were you just needed to draw us at that point to lock in. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what happened in round six? Uh, so round, round six, I was in the pod one again. I was against Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. I was against the Sauron player who was in my top four with me. And I was against, uh, what was the last guy? What was the last guy? Let me, let me look. Let me, let me remind myself here. Like Paxton? Oh, it was the other, it was the other, it was the other Kinnam player, Aaron Miller. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, And I, and I told them, I was like, I told Aaron Miller, cause he was the one, he was at 50. So all three of us, Dallas, Dallas packed, or yeah, Dallas packed and myself were like all down and draw. And Aaron was concerned at 15 points. And I said, here's the deal. If you double ID, you will be the top of the 17 players. Like absolutely, you will be the top of the 17 players. And so the way it worked last time was there was 205 people in the last tournament. This one had 222, so 17 people more, which is not crazy more at that point for points. 
and 17 was the cut. One 17 missed it last time. I believe it was six or seven 17s made it. So like a good number, like most of the 17 pointers made it, only one missed. So realistically, adding in another 20-ish people, you might think, okay, maybe two or three 17s made it, and that did end up holding true. So if you were already at 15 points at that point, and you double ID'd in, because you are playing against all the people with the three four wins at that point, your opponent win percentage is going to be better. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I was like, if you double ID in, you are literally locked, I would bet my life on it. Like, I have no concern saying that. He ended up saying he wanted to play it out, and then surprisingly, Dallas was like, I want to play it out. I was like, why? And he was like, because I just want to lock the one seed for sure. And I was like, sure, bro. <laughs> but so we ended up we ended up playing it out. Um, and and you know, fucking ten minutes into the game, they offer the draw, and I'm like, sure, whatever. Like we can we can draw. I'm in fourth seed. I don't really care. Uh, end up just like straight worldly tutoring for Consphinx, playing a Consphinx, and then absolutely obliterating them the following turn. Won the game anyway. So it was back to back round five, round six. I took the ID. Ended up winning both of the games that we played out. So I would have been at five and one and twenty-five points, but instead I was sitting there at seventeen at uh, three, one, and two, which was fine. Put me in a spot to just ID the next round and be in really good standing for top sixteen. So I, I had no qualms with it at all. I'm, I'm always just happy to get the top sixteen, and I'm not too worried about seed order when I get there most of the time. Nice. Our round six was a a must win for me. Um, you know, other people. And, and it was for everybody else in the pod too. This was a really cool pod because we had just ice in it uh, in first seat on his blue farm list, which is, uh, I highly recommend people check out his list because he's got some spice in there, dude. Some spice to, that's worth checking out. Um, he was running Narset, the uh, the new Narset, which was uh, pretty cool. Um, and then we had Brandon Driscoll, who was on Malcolm Kettis and Caveman in last seat on his blue farm list. Um, this game was interesting. I had a pretty solid start. Nothing crazy was really happening um, until I, I think I got I got a Mystic Remora on board at one point. And at that point, I had both Mystic Remora and Talion in play, and I was drawing a shit ton of cards. Um, uh, oh, the one interesting thing was Malcolm Kettis got a turn one one ring. So that was nice as far as I'm concerned because all attention went on him and everyone promptly beat him into oblivion. Um, so he was taken out of the game pretty quick. Um, meanwhile, I'm drawn. Wait, a yep. you, were, you were against Malcolm Kettis twice? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Jesus. I'm telling you, I, I was in the jungle, dude. The jungle this, yeah. this entire time. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'll have to look at the exact numbers afterwards of how many like actual meta decks I faced, but it wasn't many. Um, so in any case, uh, um, I'm, I'm drawing a shit ton of cards. It goes to Caveman's turn. Uh, time's getting kind of low, but not too bad. Uh, I have 14 cards in hand at this point, and Caveman decides that this is his, his chance to go for it. I think he, from his perspective, he looked at me and he didn't think he was going to get another turn. Um, but I'm like, you know, he didn't. He did get another turn, but but I'm looking at him. He's got a bunch of cards in hand. I'm looking at Just Dice. He's drawn off of his, you know, he's drawn off his uh, Tim Necrom. So he's got a bunch of cards in hand. I'm like, I'm not going for it on my turn if it stays like this. Um, but uh, Caveman has a Wishclaw Talisman in play, and he decides to, to make a run at it. And at which point, I immediately start begging. I'm like, I'm like, dude, Josh, please, please, this is not the window, dude. Please do not go for this. If you go for this, what's going to happen is. We're going to stop you, and then Just Ice is going to win. Um, and I'm not going to have enough juice left to stop him. Please stop. Please stop. He's like, nah, I think I'm going for it. I think I'm going for it. So he starts going through the motions. Like, he he cracks the Witch Claw Talisman, gives it to Just Ice. I'm like, fuck, oh, this is not going to go well. Um, you know, he, I, he casts, a, like, an intuition. Um, you know, he I don't remember all of the things that he did, but he started, like, making a real push. And I stopped him. And I stopped him again. And then I stopped him again, and I'm like, dude, please, please, I'm begging for the last time, please don't go for it. Uh, at this point, like most of my resources are gone. Yes, I have a hand that's full, but the only interaction I really have left um, is uh, that's free interaction is my force of will. The big, the big cost was I had to tap all of my lands to stop all of this, um, and I'm like, like, look, I'll, like, I still have more interaction. And I showed him the force of will. At which point he's like, fine, all right, I'll stop. Um, and he passes the turn to Just Ice. Um, Just Ice then does exactly what I predicted. He cracks that Wishclaw Talisman, hands it back to Caveman, casts his own Wishclaw Talisman, cracks that Wishclaw Talisman, and then puts a Teferi Time Raveler on the stack. All right, and I'm like, well, all right, I'll throw my Force of Will into the fire. 
I cast my Force of Will, counter the, the, the Teferi. He then proceeds to cast Thassa's Oracle and Demonic Consultation. Um, and I get I get Caveman to feed me one more card by casting. I don't remember what spell it was, but it wasn't important. Final Fortune. Yeah, there you go. Final Fortune. Uh, he had a deflecting spot in his hand, so he could have drawn me one more card. Turns out that wouldn't have helped either. Hey, you guys you guys missed that. I was looking at it, yeah. and you guys were like, he can't cast anything else. And I was like, I know he can, but yeah, I can't yeah. say anything. <laughs> yeah, but it, did, it just didn't make any difference. You know, as it turns out, after the fact, when like I looked at his whole hand to see what he had, uh, he did have a Odawara. And the managed to, to play Odawara. So if he had communicated, or if I had asked him, um, and we had we had worked together a little bit, then he could have Odawara the um, to ferry instead of me countering it. Um, but I'm like I'm like, dude, you know, honestly, if you had done that, then you're just king making me at that point. Then I just win. Um, so you know, I think Just Dice earned that win completely. Um, you know, and we talked afterwards. And it's just one of those things where, like, in those mid range hell games where everybody has a draw engine on board and everyone's drawing cards, the first person to go for it is the next person who wins. Um, and that's just... But again, so what, what Caveman is supposed to do there, as much as people hate it, is he's supposed to recognize that he is the Ottawara. He already has the knowledge that you have the Force of One Hand. Yep. And so, you know, you communicate that you would like him to bounce at the ferry, and he says that seems to make sense. And then, you know, when the Thassa's Oracle goes on the stack... And you talk about him on a wiring. You he reveals the wire. He says that you have a force of will, and he says, "I would like to offer a draw." Correct, hundred percent. That is what you were supposed to do in that situation. Yes, hundred percent. I know people hate it. I know people don't like these fucking draws, but like, bro, we're in a tournament. I'm gonna do what makes the most sense 100%. to get the most points to, to win. That is correct to do. Don't get mad about it. Hundred percent, hundred percent agree. And at that point, we would have still been alive going into round seven, whereas a third loss puts us out of the tournament. So, um, so Just Ice gets the win, I get the loss. Me and Caveman are sad together, um, you know. But it is what it is, you know. At that point, oh, I, you know, I forgot, I forgot one other really uh, key piece of information, just an anecdotal um, little thing. Uh, that is, you know, before round six started, the judge asked everyone to count their cards to make sure everybody had cards. Uh, all the right mm-hmm. cards, and I counted up to 99 cards instead of 100 cards, including my commander. Uh, and turns out, I, at some point in the night, those slippery, brand new fucking dragon shields uh, slipped out of a hand, and uh, that Imperial Seal, Judgeful Imperial Seal, ended up under the couch at the Airbnb. Um, so, Judge Foil. Judge Foil Air, yeah. So, so fortunately, my my uh, my lovely co-host here had a spare. Because uh, he carries around the same Italian list I play, um, and I was able to borrow it and, and keep going. But uh, again, kind of threw me off a little bit. But I, I don't think I, I don't think I made any mistakes in that in that round six. I think I played it as well as I could have. You know, just you know, sometimes when you're playing control, it's it's difficult to convince the table that you know don't open the window for someone else. And unfortunately, that's what happened. So big loss. I am out of contention for top sixteen at this point. I'm still planning to play round seven because I want those top deck uh, uh, circuit points. Um, so, but you know, kind of sad going into round seven. You, on the other hand, you're good to go, right? Total lock at this point. I was so jig chilling. Yeah, I was already locked at seventeen. That was just like gravy. Um, where we we got there, and it was one guy at sixteen uh, on the play rock side at sixteen. Myself on cannon in the second seat at seventeen. It was the Kiki Jiki guy at sixteen. Mm-hmm. And then uh, fourth seat blue farm, fifteen, and I, I saw that he was at fifteen before the round started, and we got to the table, and and I, I think I handled this overall pretty well. Um, what I said to the table is like literally we sat down, and of course the draw conversation started, and I said, look, I know you're at fifteen points, I know you have to play. We are not going to have a conversation about drawing right now. Don't worry about it. What I will say. All three of us obviously want to draw. If this game gets to a position that you are obviously in minimalistic chances to win it, it is unrealistic. I would like for us to draw. And then the Rockside player, myself, and the Kiki player all kind of agreed. We were like, if any of us wins, let's draw. Mm -hmm. Um, And I said that in a way where I said very clearly, I'm not going to king make anyone to make that happen. We're not going to play the game like that is happening, but let's keep it keep it chill like i don't i don't want it to be a 3v1 against this blue farm guy to get the draw i don't want that to be the way this goes Mm -hmm. um but like obviously there's a clear understanding that all three of us want the draw here and he's the only one who doesn't 
but I just wanted to make it not in a way where we are clearly just targeting this guy, killing him, and then doing the drop. Um, so what ends up happening is, yeah, Rock's eye on the play mulled the three, and they kept the gas as fuck three, my guy. I mean, they had, like, turn two necro or turn three necro, um, and just, like, sent it. <laughs> they, they they sent a bunch of life in the necro, and, uh, and, and, and I did not have interaction for this. Like, I wasn't holding it back. I, I didn't have the interaction for it. He didn't actually land it. Um, so he sends the necro, and he ends up hitting Born and Final Fortune on his first, like, necro for ten. And he has exactly the mana to just send the Final Fortune. So he goes, okay, Final Fortune. Um, Blue Farm does not have the answer to the Final Fortune. Um, he has, I believe, a Red Blast in hand is what ended up happening. And then at this point, though, I do want Rogside to win because that means we draw. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I kind of, I kind of coached him through it a little bit because he was almost going to make some big mistakes. Um, where he, you know, he, he untaps in his Final Fortune turn, and he started like tapping down mana to do things like his Dockside and stuff. And I could kind of see his hand, and I could see that all he had really was a SWAT. And so I, you know, he, he goes to cast the Born, and I go, no, don't do not. What? He goes, what? And I go, fucking draw 27 more cards first. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> like, like, like go, go draw some cards, my guy. And, and he goes, okay. And he does it. And so he, draw, he draws 27 more cards, finds easy, deterministic, obvious win with a shitload of protection. Um, but it turns out if he had not drawn the cards first, there was enough interaction in the other player's hands that his Born would not have gone through, and he would have not won there. Um, but you know, I, I, again, I didn't, I didn't game make. I just, I just, you know, I was okay with the outcome of him winning that game because it meant I got another point. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. draw twenty seven cards first, bro. Hey, play to win, man. Play to win. Uh, yeah, play to win. win. Yeah, play to win. Yeah. Um, and he was like, he was like, you're right. After the game, that was the correct thing to do. Which is why I was surprised he like started doing stuff in his turn before he did that because uh, during the turn, I was like, I, I said to him at the start of his turn, I was like, do you already have the born by chance? And he literally flipped it up, and I was like, can we just draw? And the blue form guy was like, nope, gotta play it. And I was like, that's fine. But so then he like cast the Dockside and did stuff, and it did end up in a way where he had to like leave floating colorless mana on the table to draw the cards and then go for Born. Where if he had just not played his Dockside and stuff yet and just waited, because he tapped like Mana Crypt and a land for the Dockside, if he had just waited, it would have made no, no difference and he would have had more mana. Which So technically it was optimal to just cast no spells, just draw the card and then Born. Because mm -hmm. also less less cards played means less likely to get my Break Trap, less likely for all of these things. Um, so it's optimal for him to just draw the cards and go to end step there, but he chose to play Docks and stuff first, which was fine. But as long as he didn't cast the board before drawing a bunch of cards, it was it worked out okay. Um, so we, we we drew. The one thing I did feel bad about here was the way Breakers ended up working out. The Kiki player was like one of the bottom 16s, but I was like, yeah, it's the people who are at 12 points who are going to get a win here that are going to knock you out. Like that's or that are not going to like you're going to knock them out because your Breakers are just better. Um, yeah, he just it ended up happening. Point two percent because of Manila Midget, because Manila Midget played against Dallas and people. He got put up to the pod one, so mm -hmm. he played against but like he played against multiple four win people. Damn. So because of that, his breakers like just beat out the Kiki guy. Damn. Um, that sucks. Which Kiki Kiki guy, is super nice guy, super sick list, really really cool strategy. Like absolutely want to shout him out. Would have been super cool to have him in the top of his team. I hope Ian mentions it. At uh, number seventeen in, in the video, which also like just ice, dude. He, he did. He tried to do the same thing as last time. He didn't make the cut again this time, but like he started out oh three. Oh yeah, he fought hard, <laughs> and then man. just clawed back, bro. Fucking clawed back as he does. So sad. Before we get in the top sixteen, before we yeah. get to round eight, we gotta talk about the most base fucking shit I've ever seen in my life. Manila midgets round seven, bro. Manila midget sixteen points, right? 16 points he's against jorman he's against dallas and he's against the pantlaza guy and they all are immediately like yeah let's fucking draw and sean goes i'm not comfortable with my breakers we are absolutely playing this game cut the draw talk <laughs> like sets sets his dick on the table right away and says i don't give a fuck we are playing this game and the game continues and bro I've, I've heard about this game in the early stages before I saw it from him. This man ate every piece of interaction known to man. I think like 10 counter spells were just used on Sean shit this game. He just turned two. He told me he had one ring or he had Bergy Horn on turn two. I'm like, oh, I played one ring. He goes, nah, bro. I slammed down the horn. He's like, the Bergy Horn is cracked. <laughs> and he starts fighting. He starts fighting in every which way. They stop him several times. He's like quickly dying. They're beating the shit out of him. And, and he's, and like multiple times they're offering him draws in situations where I'm looking at the table, watching the game and I'm like, take the draw, bro. <laughs> like you are not winning this one. There's no fucking way. And he goes, look, 
I'm not taking the fucking draw. I'm playing to my fucking outs. Like, get out of here. <laughs> he denies the draw like three times during this game where every moment I looked at it, I would have taken it. Damn. Like, absolutely just says absolutely fucking no. And like proceeds to push win attempt after win attempt. Goes on this cracked as fuck fucking born upon a win burgy horn turn where he just like needs to hit all the pieces. And he gets so close. And he ends up like one or two mana short of actually winning the fucking game. Um, and then they finally kill him. And then the other three players just agree to a draw. So because he got the draw, he did end up being number 16 getting into top 16. But that game was just wild. So fucking, so fucking shit to see Sean just tell everyone to get the fuck out of here think, with their th ID bullshit. I think it's time to say I'm, I'm going. I think it's time to revise you know, my earlier statement from our last podcast. I don't think that Waffle is actually the premier Dargo Thrasios player. I think Sean. I think Sean is the premier Dargo Thrasios player. Waffle, I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry. That shit is it, that's based, man. Afraid of nothing. Nothing. He's fucking on one, dude. Bring he it. Plays, he plays. But that's the thing. So, so Waffle plays Doug with Rass like a patient, opportunistic window taker. And Sean plays Doug with Rass like it's Rogsai. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the difference in how they play. And Sean just, yeah, no fear. He's like, I'm going to fucking try and win the game. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, it's cool. It was cool. He's to a see. Badass, it was man. cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. Anything, anything you want to say before top 16? No, just congrats to all the people who made top 16. It was cool because so many people from our little Airbnb made it. Like, it pretty, pretty and crazy. Pretty, pretty incredible, how, really. How, how many did? It was myself, Waffle, I mean, let's, let's look Sean. Yeah. I mean, Ian come, came and hang out, hung out with us. So, yeah. 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 So, you, Waffle, um, Thorn. Thorn made it. That's uh, for right. Khan, who the, it. Right. Um, Sean made it. Um, yeah. Zach, exactly. Zachary Scipiani came out and hung out with us at the house. So, you know. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. Zach and Eric and Ian, like, all came and hung out. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Okay. But, like, from, from from the Airbnb, it was, like, four of us. It was it was me. Yeah, four Evan, of the top 16 Thorne, in one house. That's I mean, pretty. Yeah. That's pretty hot. That's pretty, that's hot. pretty hot. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty hot. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, yeah. Should I just go right into it? Let's do it, man. What happened top 16? Uh, Top 16, I'm in second seat for this game. We have Blue Farm on the play. We have myself going second. We have Rog Thras Polymorph, which no one from our pod had played against this deck in the tournament. Um, so we did not know for sure if he was Polymorph for like Dockside Infinite Mana. Um, we ended up figuring out over a few turns that it was in fact Polymorph. Um, but but yes, yeah, so we weren't sure. And then fourth seat, we had Aaron Miller also on Kinnon. Um, he was the guy who was in my, my round six where we ended up taking the ID. Uh, so it was a double Kinnon pod, Blue Farm on the play, Rock Thrass in, in, in third seat. Uh, Blue Farm starts the game off with a turn one on the play, Drain of Magistrate. Mm. And I go, that kind of sucks. Uh, okay, so I go land, soul ring, talisman, lotus petal on turn one, uh, which is five mana uh, without Kinnon. And then I go to my second turn, I untap and I top deck an Ancient Tomb, and I go, sweet, that's seven mana. Uh, here's a hard cast Nezahal on turn two with no Kinnon. <laughs> that's insane. Hot. <laughs> Fucking hot. Um, and, I mean, yeah, but like that's what I love about Dranith games, is like I'm allowed to develop a little more because I don't have Kinnon. And this game ended up becoming like Blue Farm's game to lose. He was in such a dominant place. You know, he had his Tim on board pretty quickly afterwards. He had a he had a um, a Bowmaster on board pretty quickly afterwards and started pinging me down and was just swinging at us every turn. And my life total got stupid low. I ended up down to like seventeen or fifteen or something just a few turns into the game. Where I mean, again, I had a bunch of mana on board. Um, and I and I started looking at it and I had a Glenlender at this point too. I hard cast a Glenlender in these turns and I'm looking at my hand. And I have a Grim Monolith on the board tapped. And I have a Green Sun Zenith in hand. And I think that this was the key decision point that won me this game. Was the Green Suns, I ended up casting a Green Suns for X equals 7. And not getting Nyx Blue Ancient. I got Thorn Mammoth. Mm. Um, and I think that was literally the decision that won me this game. Because getting the Thorn Mammoth let me have the removal to start picking Blue Farm apart. First thing I killed was the Bowmasters. And then I even told them, I was like, I have no interest in getting rid of the Dranith right now. I got Rog Thras right over here. I got another Kinnon deck right there who's rocking the One Ring, drawing a bunch of cards. I don't need Kinnon right now. Like, I don't have anything that needs Kinnon right now. So I'm unconcerned about Kinnon at this time. Um, and then the, the play that ended up starting the drama afterwards happened where Rog Thras untaps after this. 
and they cast a Wheel of Fortune. Um, at this point in the game, the Ether Cannon deck has an onboard Perplexing Chimera, and Blue Farm um, uh, decides to cast an overloaded Cyclonic Rift into the onboard Perplexing Chimera, which for those who have read my primer and heard me talk about this play before, I literally have it as one of the biggest punts you can do with a Perplexing Chimera. And, you know, we're, we're two days in playing Magic the whole fucking time. Um, I'm normally a very calm, goofier, like try and joke around, keep everything light type of person. And my tone definitely slipped in this moment where I said in a pretty harsh tone, that's dumb as shit, don't do that. Um, and that was incorrect for me to have used that tone. It is not cool, it is not okay to talk in that tone. It was definitely over aggressive. It was not the correct way to handle it. I did immediately catch myself. I immediately apologized for my tone in that moment, but the, the guy was clearly a little bit up, upset about it, which is totally understandable. Um, that's not the kind of tone you should be talking in these games and we need to do better about that like as a community and I need to be better about that as a person. Um, but so Blue Farm, you know, swaps the Chimera with the Cyclonic Rift and then I have to force of negation the Cyclonic Rift. So realistically, it did kind of work out for Blue Farm in that way where they did end up with the Chimera on their board. It's just a shame that I had to use the interaction to stop it because I, I, I'm not getting my whole board bounced there into a wheel. I mean, I, that takes me 100% out of the game. Right. Um, and, and I have the Glenelender on board. So like people know they can't fight me stopping the Psych Rift. Like that's not the right use of their interaction. But at this point, a few things have been used. And so the Wheel of Fortune's on the stack and, and I'm looking at a hand that's like not bad. Like I actually have the most cards at hand. And so I, I throw down the MBT on the on the wheel at this point because Blue Farm is like end of they cast like a mystical tutor and some other stuff. Um, and so I throw down the I throw down the wheel of fortune or I throw down the MBT and then the uh, rock grass player has a counter for my MBT I believe it was and then you know Blue Farm is talking and I'm really curious if he's going to counter the counter or not um, or however this goes because I really wanted to know how good his hand was. Um, and in my brain, I was like, if he if he fights to try and make sure the wheel doesn't go through, I know his hand is disgusting. And so he ended up trying to do that. And so I, I the wheel the wheel did go through, and he ends up discarding Grand Abolisher, Underworld Breach, like like everything you need in one in one pile of cards. His hand was like absolutely disgustingly gas. Um, I end up drawing into a hand that is like okay. Uh, it wasn't a fantastic hand, but the fact that I had the Neza Hall on board means I could still grind some card advantage. And really importantly, I had the Thor Mammoth, which would like allow me to utilize windows really, really well. Uh, we end up in a position here where on my next turn, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the Blue Farm player um, because we think we're dead to Kinnon in fourth seat on his next turn because he's going to untap with a ton of mana. He's got the one ring that's going to draw him like five more cards. And he's at a pretty low life total where if I hit him with Thorn Mammoth and Neza Hall, he is dead to his one ring trigger. Mm -hmm. And so we end up agreeing on a deal where I will swing the Thorn Mammoth and the Neza Hall at him under the condition that absolutely no damage comes my way until my next turn. Um, and he tries to say, well, like, no, I'll just swing the bird at you. Like, I got to draw some cards. And I'm like, no. You make the deal that absolutely not a single point of damage comes at me or I'm not swinging these guys at this guy. And you know you can't beat him with that advantage and me with this advantage. Um, and so he, he, you know, kind of agrees to the deal. He ends up casting a Vamp Tutor and we kind of have a conversation about it. Um, and I end up deciding, like, okay, we'll let the... I forget if I counter the Vamp Tutor or not. I think I flustered it. I think I ended up Fluster Storming the Vampiric Tutor because I had a conversation with the Rock Grass player. Because in my hand, my only piece of interaction was Fluster Storm. And the Rock Grass player, we, we revealed interaction because we didn't want to lose to Blue Farmer Kinnon. And then we were trying to figure this out here. Um, because my board, while like, it had a lot of mana and it had a Thorn Mammoth and Ezahol, like it, it wasn't set up to win in any way, like notably. Um, so I'm talking to Rock Grass and he reveals to me that he has a Swan Song and a Fluster Storm as well. I literally laughed and I was like, I got the same shit, my guy. <laughs> and I shut up the Fluster. Um, but so the Vampiric Tutor's on the stack and I'm talking to Blue Farm and I'm like, well, we have not fully agreed on this Thorn Mammoth and Hall deal yet. Like this Vamp Tutor is on the stack right now. Um, and, and we're having a conversation about it and I'm like, I need to know that you're not getting something that's winning the game if you want me to do this. Because I'm not taking this guy out using my interaction, you know, getting rid of all of his interaction that he obviously has on Kenan when he has that many cards in hand and then just losing to you. Uh, and he is unwilling to make a deal that he will not get anything like that we can agree on. Um, and so I end up fluster storming his vampiric tutor, and then we make the deal that I will kill the other kin, and he will uh, not send any damage my way. And that is that is followed through on. Um, so after that turn, it goes. Player does that. Uh, Rockthrass just like kind of untapped, 
didn't really do anything and pass. He really didn't do that much this entire game. Um, then Kinnon goes to their upkeep. They die to their one ring trigger. Uh, and then we go to Blue Farm Stern. And Blue Farm plays down um, like a, a Boromir. And they already had a Ranger Captain. And or I think they play the Ranger Captain. And they played a Boromir. And they have the Tranith. And they're talking about how if they're going to lose to me and whatnot. And I'm like, okay. I kind of got to make sure I cook these guys on exactly this turn. This is this is my window. I had drawn into, from a Netherhall trigger, I had drawn into a Phoenix Blimey. So now I have the Phoenix Blimey in hand that works with the Grim Monolith. And I believe on like the next spell that I cast, I also drew into the Flesh of Vault. So I'm like, I have this in hand right now. I need the Thorn Mammoth to kill things. Um, so what I ended up doing, I think on actually one turn previous, I, I like killed the Boromir um, so I could cast my Mox Opal. Because I was like, he was like, don't you want to turn off their interaction? I was like, no, <laughs> like, like I do not. I, I, I would like to play my mox. Like, oh, I don't think the Boromir is. I don't think the Boromir is doing anything but protecting you here. So I'm not interested in, in keeping that around. Um, but so what I do is on end step, I discard three. Oh, so sorry, not an end step. In his second main phase, when he's passing the end step, I discard three cards to Nezahal, which exiles it and then brings it back on end step, which will once again trigger Thorn Mimic. And so then on that. Thorn Mammoth. Oh, that's I hot. That's hot. I killed that's a hot. I kill Ranger Captain. This is what I'm saying. Like the decision to get Thorn Mammoth there, I do not think a lot of cannon pilots would have done that. I think a lot of them would have said, I have the Grim, I need this for the next bloom, this is my out. And I said, I am gonna die if I do not start picking this shit apart. And I went and got Thorn Daddy, bro. I love Thorn Daddy. That shit is insane. If you can continuously create creatures, you pick apart the entire board. It's a six six that fights on everything. It's yeah. crazy. And especially, yeah, I had the Nezahal. I was like, I can get a trigger when I need it. Um, so I get rid of the Ranger Captain, which only leaves the Draineth. I don't even care about the Draineth at this point. I also have Ottawa in hand. And so I, I untap on what is the last penultimate turn of the game. Um, and I, yeah, I, I like tap through my mana. I consider a few lines. I think I, I think I might've already like killed the Draineth as well. I, I like started with like playing a thing and I think I killed the Draineth. And so Kinnon was an option here, or maybe it was like, I, oh yeah, I was doing math on like, I could play an elf and then play Kinnon. Does that make me more mana with mana rocks versus just playing Nick's Bloom? I had several pieces of interaction in hand. I know there was a revealed chain of vapor. I had a spell sky, so I wasn't worried about that. Um, and so I was kind of doing all the math out and I was like, it actually maths out better to just play the Nick's Bloom first. And so I end up tapping out all of my mana except for a Soul Ring and the Simic Signet, um, the one that the one that taps for both colors, which right. is really good with Nick's Bloom, um, to cast Nick's Bloom. Nick's Bloom, Nick's Bloom ETBs. Uh, I then tap the Soul Ring for six colorless mana, and that's why, dude, Simic Signet is always so good because Nick's Bloom, you know, it's two times three now. It's even better. Um, so I so I do that. I try to untap the Grim Monolith. I try and respond with the Chain of Vapor. I respond by um, Spell Skite. Uh, Spell Skite. You know, getting rid of that shit, get that out of here. I then produce infinite colored mana. I then play the treasure vault from hand um, and then proceed to to win the game, kind of picking apart the pieces. Um, they wanted me to play it out with the Thrasios in the graveyard because that was in the graveyard from the wheel. Um, and that was one of the other reasons I was like, kind of like, maybe I don't want a wheel here is because I had Thrasios in hand and I had the and I had the Grim Monolith on board. So I was like, I can win without Ken in here if I can find a way to Nyx Bloom. Um, but so they knew Thrasios was in the graveyard, so he was telling me to play it out. So what I ended up doing was showing the line where I like, went infinite, I put my creatures in the play. Very importantly, before I did Thrasios stuff, I bounced my Nezahal in my hand, because that is a forced draw, which I think is what he was thinking. I might draw my deck with Thrasios, and then he can cast any spell and make me from a card of moves. Um, but so I made sure to bounce the Nezahal, and once I did that, uh, he scooped it up. Um, regarding the Psychrift play, we do need to talk about for a second. I did apologize at another point in the game about my tone in that moment, and I did use no other harsh tones at any other point in that game. And at the end of the game, I once again tried to have a short conversation with that player where I apologized for my tone in that moment, um, you know, and, and his response, he, he clearly is a guy who doesn't like me, and that's that's okay. Not everyone is going to like you, know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, his response was, I guess you win by calling people fucking stupid. Um, which is not what I did. I did not call him stupid, but also that's not how I play. And so I even said, you know, that's not how I play. And his response was to just tell me, you, you and I both know that is how you play, which anyone who's played with me consistently knows that is entirely untrue. Um, but this guy was clearly upset, not in a very good mood from the situation. You know, I, I, I apologize. I felt like I did what I could to try and remedy things in the moments. Um, what did end up as a result of the situation was I was now headed to top four. And I quickly found out as I was the last one to win their top four game that this was going to be my 10th ever top four in a major event. And it was the first time ever that I was going to be on the play, which I was very, very excited about. That has never happened to me before. And I was thinking it's all coming together. This is it. I'm going to win the, the first 
the, the largest turn in CDH tournament history. That's going to be my first win. I'm so excited. Um, and the Blue Farm player from a top 16 game immediately went after our game and went and spoke with some judges. And um, after, you know, 10 minutes of happy celebration, um, that now I'm in the top four against my friends, you know, Ian, Ian and Waffle, and so excited to do this. Uh, Baldy comes and sits down with me, and he lets me know that I will be receiving a turn skip for unsportsmanlike conduct, um, which was pretty fucking brutal to hear in this moment. Um, I immediately yeah. asked for an appeal. I said, that is an egregious ruling. There's no way that is correct. He said, I am the head judge. There is no appeal for this. Um, I immediately broke down in tears in front of CDH community, which is really not what I wanted to do right before the biggest, most important game of my life. Um, and, you know, I, I said, I would like to go outside and have a cigarette and try and calm down. I was, I was pretty in shambles if anyone saw me from that news. Um, and so I ended up going outside and I had a cigarette with Jacoby who worked for Chaos. Um, and I was also escorted by the, uh, the like level five appeals judge who was there, a really nice guy, talked to him a bunch this weekend. And, you know, I told Jacoby what had happened. We we're like, yeah, I used the Hearthstone you know, during the psychic communication. And, you know, I'm, apparently that's unsportsmanlike contact and I'm taking a turn skip. But he was clearly upset by that ruling. He was like, that is absolutely egregious and ridiculous. Um, the normal ruling in the IPG for anything like that is three warnings. In it. Um, so he immediately talked to the level five appeals judge. He was like, this is incorrect. Like, you guys have to reassess this. This is not fair. Um, and the level five judge went and talked with Baldi again. And um, Baldi, I guess, went back around to my opponents who were in that game to get their side of the story and try and get a clearer picture. And then sat down with me again at this point, you know, 20 minutes of me being like absolutely freaked out, and just like the worst possible move from this news. Um, we had a conversation where it pretty much came down to the way the story had been told to him from the Blue Farm player. It came across as if I had like looked at this guy and called him fucking stupid. Um, and there's a big difference between looking at someone in the eyes and saying, you're fucking stupid and saying, don't do that. That's a dumb play. Um, either one in a harsh tone, but there is a difference there because one of those is an insult directed at the player. And one of them is a comment on a play. And the way they had heard it from the blue farm player was me insulting him as a person, which is absolutely unacceptable and not okay. And there's no world that I would ever look at someone and say, you're fucking stupid. Um, I said, don't do that. That's dumb as shit when there was an overloaded cyclonograph going into an awkward chimera, which is discussing the play, not the person. Everyone makes mistakes. I would never call anyone dumb because they make a mistake in a CDH game. We're on, this is a top 16 game of the largest tournament ever. No one would ever be stupid in that situation. Um, but so yeah, uh, after talking to my opponents, he, he asked one of my opponents if they could confirm if it was directed at the player or the person, and the opponent was just like, honestly, I can't give you 100% either way. So he decided to side on the side of leniency and remove the turn skip that I would not be not be missing my my first turn in the finals game, um, which was the correct decision. And and I appreciate the effort the judge put into this like quick investigation. I I do 100% empathize with their side of things. You know, if they're under the interpretation that I'm, that I'm calling people fucking idiots to their face, that's obviously unacceptable communication. The way I communicated in that moment was still unacceptable with the, with the psych script on the stack. I absolutely stand by that, but. You know, I, I made a mistake. I apologize for it. I do not believe that the correct ruling for that mistake should be a turn skip in any world. I think that is absolutely thousand percent agree. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do understand. If I if I looked at him, I said, "You're fucking stupid." If I looked him in the face and I said that, absolutely, give me a turn skip. But that's just that's just not what happened. Um, yeah. So yeah, I do appreciate the judges. I do empathize with them having to deal with this. I, I have nothing. You know, I told Baldy afterwards we talked, and I was like, "I have nothing against you. I understand you're doing your job. I understood that." From the information you had at the time, these were the decisions you make. I respect all of that. It's okay. What did really suck about it was um, 20 minutes of literally bawling my eyes out, thinking I was getting a turn skip in the biggest CDH game of my life. I'm finally on the play. I was not in a good mindset, even after the turn skip had been removed. Um, for anyone who saw me there, I was pretty like, I just put my hood on, didn't say a word, kind of just stone faced. I just wanted to go home and get over it at that point. So probably didn't play my best magic. Um, it was tough to it was, what is that? it was tough to watch, you know, because I remember when you came over and like you know I could tell immediately like uh oh something serious is happening because you know you were trying like to hold the tears back and you know I could see you were suffering and it was like oh my god what what happened here um, and you know, my immediately thought like immediate thought like when you explained what happened I was like nah 
this isn't gonna stick. That doesn't make sense. You know, I'm sure like, like, like I understand a warning there. Like, like I get it. Like, and you know, I, you know, for those of, of you out there who like who have not played in a top four game or top 16 game at these tournaments, the intensity of these games is insane. And emotions are high, stress is high. You know, this kind of thing can happen. Um, you know, and we can, we all make mistakes. So to me, like, okay, you know, hey, here's a warning. Don't fucking do that again. Like, totally, totally legit. Totally makes sense. Getting a turn skip going on the play in a top four match of the biggest tournament ever after something like that. Like, me and everybody around me, as we're watching this unfold, we're like, that doesn't make sense. That's really confusing. You know, why is this happening? Um, and my immediate thought was, like, this, there's no way this stands. And, and like, kudos, like, honestly, kudos to Baldi and the judges and the way that they work these things. I mean, like this is like on them, a tremendously difficult situation and they got it right in the end. So, you know, kudos to them. Great job on their part, um, working through an extremely difficult situation um, so that they got it right in the end. It, 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 the damage is done to you regardless because, you know, I'm sure that like putting your head back together at that point, gathering the emotion, shaking off the, the exhaustion that comes from all those feelings, just really tough um but like you know it is what it is like you you still got in there and you played right how how, how did the game go um yeah so i mean um yeah which i mean obviously like ian and waffle were buddies of mine they were very nice and supportive and like understood if i needed a sack and i was like get it over with i like <laughs> really didn't want to be playing magic at that point i was in no fucking good um so yeah i mean we, we go into the top four match um i mulligan to five on the play i kept a hand that was Two lands, Springleaf Drum, Arcane Signet, Manglehorn. Um, was like Manglehorn on the play, turn two, that seems okay. Um, not a great hand that's going to like progress anything gas, which is really more what I wanted being on the play. Um, but it is what it is. You, know, you deal with the hand you got, and I didn't want to mull to four again. So <laughs> we, we kept that. Um, second place, Sauron, also mull to five. Waffle in third seat, also mull to five. Ian in fourth seat on Blue Farm uh, kept first or second seven, kept second seven. So he was the only one who kept a, a full grip, um, and that kind of explains, I think, one of the the plays that some people viewed as questionable, which was the mental misstep, which I'll get to in a second. So I mean, turn one, I just go land spring with jump pass. Uh, Sauron goes like literally Urza Saga pass. Waffle goes land Esper pass, and then Ian goes land soul ring and he did the thing where like when you just don't think you know a lot of people just like mox diamond pitching this they like don't even think about it they just like play the rocks really quickly not expecting them to be countered he like played the soul ring and like was immediately trying to tap it to play something else and no priority was ever passed on soul ring the Sauron player was like hold up mental misstep um and ian was obviously very pissed about this mental misstep and he did the why would you do that thing um which I absolutely understand his frustration with the play. I do actually think the play was correct. I understand that the Esper Sentinel from Waffle is another really good target there, but I think that you have to consider the fact that all three of us mauled to five and Ian kept a second seven, and like letting him get off to a strong start on Kinnon with the mana of Soul Ring can be really quick to get out of hand. Um, so I definitely think there's a consideration for hitting the Esper Sentinel before you have the knowledge of the Soul Ring. Like I absolutely stand by that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think. With the current situation of there's an Esper Sentinel board already and the Soul Ring gets cast there, I, I, I do think it was correct to to hit it. Um, you know, I, I definitely see the thought process there. So then I untap on my second turn um, and I play Manglehorn, which just kills the Esper anyway. So I was like, sick. <laughs> like the Soul Ring was going away either way, but it actually worked out better than he missed up the Soul Ring because then he doesn't also have this Ringleaf Drum that he played the following turn type thing. Um, so then, yeah, I do that. Um, we go to. Uh, I just go, I go, yeah, I play the Manglehorn. Sauron just like plays a land of passes. Waffle, I forget if he got out Timna or if he vamped. I think he got out Timna this turn, um, which was fine. Gets out of Timna. Or he might have vamped an upkeep and gotten fish. It was one of the two. Um, but either way, he plays, he plays one of those things. And then you go to Ian's second turn. He plays out a Delighted Halfling. Um, and I believe the Springleaf Drum as well. Yes, he did. Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, no, 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 he didn't, yeah, he didn't play the Springleaf Drum, we just went to Light at Halfling, I think. Maybe he played with the Springleaf as well. Uh, and then on my third turn, I go, Kinnon, tap the Elf for Rock, Rock. So now I'm like off to the head mana start. I'm on the play, I have the Mega Horn slowing them down. I'm feeling pretty good. My last card in hand is a early to her. Um, so here is where, yeah, I believe Waffle, Waffle goes for the Vamp for the Fish. Um, you know, and I can say I saw I saw Sauron like considering countering it. I really wish he did. 
Uh, if he had if he encountered this this vamp, which was obviously getting a fish, then I think my worldly tutor might have won me the game, which would have been really sick. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been that would have been super nice. And so uh, he doesn't though. Waffle gets a fish down. I did fuck up not casting the worldly tutor in response to the fish, uh, which ended up drawing Waffle two more cards between my worldly tutor and the dispel out of Sauron, which maybe made the difference. Who knows? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but so, so that happened. I, I, I really was kind of mad at myself when I forgot to fire off the worldly tutor. And then Ian also draws him a card with the fish with the spring leaf chump coming into play tapped. And then I try and do the worldly tutor. It gets countered. I untap. Um, I draw. I think it was packed in negation. And so I just fire off a kinnon activation, completely whiff. All the times to fucking whiff my guy. Like okay, sounds good. We go another turn cycle. You know, I, I draw force of will for turn. And then I and then I. Um, I tap for another main phase cannon activation, and I hit a Thorn Mammoth. Where the only other option I pile was like a Birds of Paradise, I think. I think it was like Birds of Paradise Spell Skite were the two options I hit there. Um, but I was like, yeah, we're taking, a, we're taking Thorn Daddy right now. And the options at that point were to kill Ian's Kinnon or to kill Waffle's Timno. Waffle was gaining a lot of card advantage, and so I was actually more interested in getting rid of the Timna, I think was correct. Um, because it's also advantageous to me if Waffle ends up needing to use a little bit of interaction on Ian. So. Maybe it was correct to kill the cannon there. I mean, obviously it would have ended up keeping Ian off of Consmix mana the following turn, which could have been a big difference, but yeah, we can go through the hypothesis of what would have happened if I played differently a million times. I, I obviously look back at these games and I consider it a lot because I want to know if it's possible I could have won. And yeah, hindsight's you know, maybe, 2020 though. You know, hindsight's, hindsight's 2020. 2020. Hindsight's 2020. Um, yeah, you do what was right at but the so, time. And the information yeah, I killed the Tim now. Yeah. I kill the Timna, and then immediately the Sauron player untaps and just goes Time Twister. Um, Waffle, this was this was actually the thing that did surprise me. Waffle, Chain of Vapors, the Thorn Mammoth, which the only targets on the board at that point were Ian shit. So I was a little surprised. Like, I guess he was like, oh, I don't want to have to keep... I, he wants to grind with Timna, so he doesn't want to have to keep having it die to Thorn Mammoth, but like, maybe he's worried about me getting too far ahead if I can take care of Ian. But I, mean, I don't know. I, like, I, 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 I kind of understand it. I mean, like, for the standpoint of, like, I don't want repeated removal on your board. I just, I just don't want that. Right. No, I get that. I get that. But it's like, looking at the board at that time, the only other person with creatures was Ian. And so it's kind of helpful for letting me slow down the other Kinnon deck. But I, I get the thought process both ways. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just, like, a play that I was... I, I do need to talk about him on his thought process for that one. I, we, haven't, we haven't talked about it. Um, but I'm curious to hear it at least. But so we chain up members of the Thorn Mammoth. My last two cards in hand are Force Will and Pack Negation. So I said, fuck it, we're wheeling. Here you go. Um, and then E encounters my E encounters my my force anyway, so it didn't matter. Um, but so yeah, we 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 time twister, and I am last in the rotation after the time twister, which is like the last place you want to be. I've just lost the previous week to a hail mary wheel, where just people drew better hands than me, and I'm like, here we go again. Like, you know, I was actually ahead on board. Like, if we just keep the board going, how the board's going, there's a good chance I win this game. But time twister tends to change things. Who drew the best hand? Um, Waffle drew into a hand that was a bunch of talismans and like breach and brain freeze and shit. Um, but couldn't win that turn. So he just like played talisman and passed with like a couple of mana up. Ian literally just untaps and hard casts a fucking consecrated sphinx. Which I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Because the hand I drew into, the hand I drew into plus my draw for turn um, was three lands, swan song, bluster storm. Tide Spout Tyrant, Moon Silver Key, Phyrexia Metamorph. Which I do not want to jam a win there, bro. <laughs> There's like no chance that goes through. But if you look at a table where the blue farms got the fish and the Kin Index got the Con Sphinx, I don't really have a fucking choice. It was it was like the last thing I wanted to do, but I was like, fuck it, we ball. You know? And so I uh, you know, Ian, the Con Sphinx triggers on the stack. Sauron tries to play Blowmasters, he and Force of Wills it, which I was like, they could use some interaction, this is good. Um, the way it works out, the way it works out is I play the Moon Silver Key and Waffles immediately like, are you winning this turn, bro? And I'm like, I'm gonna see what I can get. <laughs> uh, and he's like, are you getting, but he's like, answer me right now, are you getting the salt? And I'm like, I'm probably getting the salt, bro. Like, what am I supposed to do right now? Um, good on you to tell me. And the so truth. I, good on you to tell me. Yeah, I, I, don't, I never lie, which is like, obviously, it's a hindrance to me at some times in my turn of play. The fact that people know that I never lie. I'm just an honest dude. I'm not. I'm not someone who's gonna lie to get a fucking win. Like that's if I had lied to get my first tournament win, I would feel so bad about it. That's just not who I am. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. But I agree. so the way it, the way it works out, 
when I cast the Basalt Monolith, which Moon Silver Key lands, I crack it, I get Basalt, I cast Basalt with the amount of mana I had for my rocks and shit. When I cast the Basalt on the stack, I have four lands up, and that is it. All of them tap for blue. So what's really important here is I have a Tide Spot Tyrant Hand, and I have a Phyrexian Metamorph, which uses only colorless, which can start a loop. So I have Swan Song and I have Fluster. If I only have to use one of those counter spells, then I can still cast the Tide Spot Tyrant, and I can still win the game. If I have to use both of those counter spells, it takes away my ability to cast Tide Spot Tyrant, and I cannot win the game. Because even if I Phyrexian Metamorph to make another blue pip or something, and I cast the Tide Spot, I then do not have a spell to start the loop. So I need to only use one counter to be able to win that turn. A Basalt on the stack, you know, um, I think I think Comedian had Fierce, I Swan Song it, he had Mental Mist up as well, I Fluster Storm. At that point, I only have the two lands. Mm -hmm. So I can no longer win the game. And I say immediately, I'm like, I can just get a kid in activation here. I will be spending one time and passing the turn. Fun fact, that spin would have hit Seedborn Muse based on the cards I drew afterwards, which would have ah. been very nice. Um, but what ends up happening is the Basalt lands. I tap the Basalt with the untapped trigger on the stack. The Waffle casts Chain of Vapor. Reach for it again. Targeting Kinnon. And here is where I am forced to really think for a second. And I realize that because of the Chain of Vapor, and my so I have two lands up, so I can recast Cannon with those two lands. So I say if I do that, and I go infinite, and I use this chain to bounce my two rocks, which are a Felwar Stone and Arcane Signet, I have once again reopened a wind line here. This chain of vapor might have saved me. And so I go, chain of vapor's cool, bounce Cannon, sacrifice a tap land, bounce my arcane signet, sacrifice a tap land, bounce my Felwar Stone. Then he goes, Aren't you gonna bounce the Consphinx? I go, not my fucking problem. And I tap my two lands and I recast Cannon. And uh you know, they convince the Sauron player to tap his Sensei stop to draw a card to give Ian more stuff on the Con Sphinx. They're looking at each other like none of us got shit. And Waffle goes, Salt. Aiming, my break trap. Oof, I saw this happen. Yeah, go on. Oof. Uh, Waffle exiles about 90 cards. Find this my break trap. Or I don't know, he, he, he'd drawn some cards, I guess, already. So maybe, you know, whatever it did, he, he exiles down about 10 cards left in the library. And I immediately say, if you cannot win, don't fucking cast this shit, bro. And he goes, let me look, let me think. And uh, and he looks through his pile for a couple of minutes, give him the time to think on that, which is like, that's not slow play, that's totally reasonable. Um, and he goes, okay, my break trap on Kenan. And I go, let me see the pile, bro. <laughs> let me, like before I respond to the mind break, I'm like, let me see what you fucking exile. And I look through his exile pile of 70 plus cards. He's got his hand of seven. He's got his like eight cards in the library. You know, Thassa's Oracle's gone. A lot of good shit's gone. I don't see Breach. I don't see Brain Freeze. I don't see Mean Bet. I know he still has outs. I know it's correct to cast a Mind Break Trap. I look at him, I nod, I go, I got you. <laughs> and Kennen is Mind Break Trapped. Um, which like, I'm not mad at Waffle to be very clear. Some people have asked me if I'm like pissed at Waffle. Like, no, he, he, he made the correct play. He did, in fact, have outs in that game. Um, I think with the revealed information, I think with me saying, where he had asked me, he said, you're spinning cannon one time and then you're passing a turn. I think there's a world where he doesn't chain a vapor there, um, which was especially surprising because I guess he had the chain of vapor for Ian's Consphinx and he let that happen, which was kind of shocking to me, um, which if he had chain of vapor that Consphinx, I'd probably win that game, which would have been sick. But like, I think that it was probably correct to do, not let Ian start drawing a bunch of cards, but um, it is what it is. Um, but so then, you know, that gets used on me. I, I, I fully agree with what Waffle did. It, I'm not mad at Waffle. It just sucks and hurt a lot because I really thought I was about to win my first tournament once the Basalt landed because then I can pay for every fish so there's no more cards drawn. Getting griefed by a consult fucking, yeah, yeah it doesn't feel great. Rough. Um, real rough, especially to see him like essentially eliminate his chance of winning the game realistically to do it. You know, feels like shit. But again, play I to your outs. play. You play to your outs. Yeah, play to your outs. Play to your outs. I get what it is. I get what it is. Um, really importantly, like he's before Ian in turn order. Like I think if he was after Ian in turn order, maybe he doesn't even cast it there. Um, but you know, Ian already has a grip of twenty cards at this point. But so I, I you <laughs> it's know, funny my, outside my... outside of the uh, of the venue at that point, everyone's sitting around watching the game, and and the explanation was, um, you know, number one, uh, Waffles Library is gone, but that deck can still win somehow. Right, that was the conversation. And number two, uh, Ian has infinite cards in hand. Is the way everyone talked about it. So yeah, it was kind of <laughs> it was it was a dumb it was a dumb scuff game at that point. Um, but again, it's like I, I had no choice but to jam there. Like I, there's no way I win yeah, the game if I don't jam there. Yeah, I don't play. So I hate just jamming that though. But um, 
So at that point, I have the one remaining colorless mana from the Basalt on tap when Kinnon was on the board, and I have Basalt on tap on the board. Kinnon is the next exile, I have no more lands left. So I tap the Basalt, four colorless, spend two of it on Arcane Signet, and then tap Arcane Signet and the two remaining colorless, pay two life, I play a Metamorph, copy Cosmics. Which I know is dumb as shit. And realistically, like the odds of me winning there are so slim. But the same way Waffle's looking at his pile of cards and saying, I have outs, it's very slim, but I have outs. I'm looking at a hand that interacts in zero ways. Yeah. I'm looking at a hand that will do nothing to stop anything. My best out there, no matter how fucking small the EV is, is I have a little short con Sphinx loop with Ian, and I draw into the nuts and he draws into garbage. That's my out there. Um, and yeah. I know it's controversial for some if it was just stupid and king naked to do, but like, we're already losing to him. I might as well fucking play to my goddamn out. You gotta fucking try. So I, you gotta fucking try. You, you gotta give fucking up. try. You never give up. You gotta dude. try. You never give up. And interestingly, like, if I hadn't done that, then we didn't draw a bunch of cards on Sauron's turn. We probably lose to Sauron with the Thoracal Consult in hand. And then we probably lose to Waffle. So, like, me doing the Consphinx loop did give me the highest chance of getting back to my turn. Um, and I stand by my decision. It's not something I wanted to do. Really nothing in this game is what I wanted to do, bro. I, I didn't want to mull the five. I didn't want to jam on that turn. I didn't want a fucking Hail Mary Time Twister to be cast in that game again. It just kind of is what it is. And like I said, I was just in a sour mood the whole time. I wasn't my normal, like, talkative, joking self. I was just kind of sitting there with my hood up. So yeah, you know, Waffle goes for his crazy ass crack line to win the game, which I immediately saw. Like, I was looking at it, I was like, because he was like, he was like, I need things to fall into place, but I have a line. I was like, I totally understand. You need to brain freeze, hit the Thoracle, and then you can fucking just like get a clone of Thoracle or hit the Thoracle, and you can get it. Like, you either need the Thoracle on board or you need to hit his Thoracle on the brain freeze, and you yeah. can get your library small enough and you can win the game. Like, I understood that was what he was going for, and that was why I wasn't mad that he cast it. Um, and yeah, he ended up on a, his line was sweet. His line was super, super sweet. You know, he cast the breach, and he ended up telling me after the game he was really happy that I convinced Ian to counter the breach because he actually didn't care that much about the breach. But in my brain, I don't know what cards he currently has in hand. And so I'm like, the breach allows him to set up really well. Cause he started the turn with the final fortune and then cast the breach. I'm like, okay, he can breach to try and set up like as much of a storm count with the LED and stuff to brain freeze for as big as possible. And then try and win at the next turn. Like that was the line I thought he was going for. So I convinced Ian to counter the breach, which Waffle was unhappy about because it meant that he did not have to protect the meme bed, which he said was the most important part. Right. So in the following turn, he like, Cast a bunch of spells. Like he cast an enlightened tutor with no artifacts left in, or, or enchantments left in his deck just to increase storm count type shit. You know, throws the meat bed on the stack at like storm count five and then holds priority, cast the break freeze, targeting Ian. He ends up, uh, the Thassa's Oracle was on the board at this point, so I knew he's going for a clone. Um, and, uh, you know, it was pretty funny. At some point before Waffle's turn, when Ian wanted to see the Con Sphinx loop, and he was like, I just want to have interaction to make sure I don't die to Waffle. And I was like, Are you willing to reveal your hand to me? And he said, Yes. And he hands me his, he hands me his hand of like 30 cards. And I see that he like doesn't have a basalt line in hand yet. Like That's at this crazy. time, he like really didn't. That's crazy. He didn't. Yeah. Have, he didn't. He, and importantly, I had the Manglehorn as well. So like all his mana rocks, he needs to remove the Manglehorn first and use mana. So I look at his hand and I'm like, this is not 100 percent over. And I saw that he already had the flesh duplicate in hand. Really importantly, um, sorry, it was just a thing flying around. Um, but so he already had the flesh duplicate in hand. So I'm not saying shit because when Waffle goes for the brain freeze, he's looking at my board and I have I have Metamorph on board. That's one less clone. Ian doesn't have a clone, but Ian has a clone in hand. So, Mills Ian doesn't hit a clone, looks at the piles and just scoops it up right there, doesn't bother. Um, in Waffle's end step, I decide to use a Force of Vigor on Ian's Springleaf Drum, which is his only artifact on the board at that point, just to try and cut him off as much mana as possible to give myself a chance. I knew he had a dose in hand and all that kind of shit. Um, and so, yeah, he untaps on his turn. Uh, immediately, he like plays dose in first thing, because I guess, obviously, he's worried about me having Kyno Magic. I did not have a single counter spell in my hand. Um, and then, you know, he plays Lotus Petal and Mana Crypt real quick. And, you know, right after the Mana Crypt comes down, I'm like, those enter Tap Pro. Um, he ends up asking the judge if he can take back the Mana Crypt because the Lotus Petal was an invalid thing to, like, have not had it come in untapped. Personally, my opinion is he probably shouldn't have been able to take back the Mana Crypt, though I really don't think it mattered. I think he had enough other mana sources in his hand where this goes this way no matter what he does. Um, but, you know, he was allowed to take back the Mana Crypt, which is fine. And then, you know, uh, re sculpts the Manglehorn. Plays out a bunch of mana rocks. Um, he had a hole breaker in hand that he could have just cast, but he decides to trophy mage for basalt instead. And then he, you know, gets back his Thrasios for with the uh, finale devastation and goes on the, the normal win lines from there. Um, yeah, super, super good game, super good win by Ian. You know, obviously not my favorite game I've ever played. Obviously didn't didn't go how I wanted it to go yet again. 
still, congrats oh, on sh- what's that third yeah. consecutive top yeah. four in, in in the month of January. Uh, fourth. fourth, fourth consecutive, consecutive fourth. In, in January. So yeah, we did four four straight weekends. Yeah, you didn't fours. win the whole thing, but like you you should yeah. be proud of yourself, dude. Like you're gonna get there. You just gotta keep putting up putting up the results, and eventually it's gonna fall in your favor. Just a matter of time. Yeah. <clears throat> and congrats to Ian. Cool. I mean, it was also know, yeah. You know, Ian's an amazing player. Waffles an amazing player. Clearly, Sauron's a real deck. Is it? I don't know, but um, you know, it was Paxton's first ever tournament, which like huge props to him. Yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, hell of a pod. Like those those games are so hard to win. So much variance. So many you know, you know, difficult positions to try to work your way out of. So you know, congrats, man. You should feel proud of yourself. You know, appreciate it. I know I should. I just don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? uh, give it it's time give it time you know yeah, yeah. what's really cool is if you you go look at the uh, top deck uh circuit rankings right now like <laughs> the top four are jorman yeah. you waffle ian <laughs> so the pantheon of greatness right there in that last pot so good shit man yeah good shit yeah that was my that was my fourth ever finals with waffle already Jesus. we've been against each other in the finals four fucking times dude that's wild fucking so many games um but yeah no it was, it was good it was good like obviously i, I like i don't know. i just i just want to stop getting memed on as somebody who can't win <laughs> you know what i mean i want to get over the hump so it's it's frustrating it is definitely frustrating yeah so i mean hell of a tournament dude you played your ass off you know there were some things you couldn't control that got in the way but great job proud of you proud of you looking forward to you know celebrating that first win that's not gonna be far away dude i'm, I'm confident of that uh, how did so. how did how did Kinnan feel after after the whole Obnix uh, run there? Kinnan's a really good deck. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough. no, it was, it was cool. It was funny because I've only played like, dude, I'd maybe played like five total games on Kinnan in the last three weeks. Like I just hadn't touched the deck, and like I mean, I guess I, I didn't mention this yet. Like I was actually gonna play Rogsai. I was just trying to send it on random shit. I like didn't give a fuck. Like I was actively the entire day before the tournament. Like Waffle propped me a Rogsai deck. I just literally only jammed games on Rock's Eye. And then I ended up jamming one game on Kinnan that night and just like destroyed on it. And I was like, okay. And I jammed another game on Kinnan that night and I just like won it. I was like, okay. And then like Ian, Ian looked at me and he was like, it is, a, it is a very large event. Like maybe you should just play Kinnan. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I went back to the boy, which I love Kinnan. I love Kinnan. Something against Kinnan. I just like, you know, I was enjoying my little arc of a break from the boy and and trying out some other decks so was, i was having a lot of fun with that i um, mean is very fun and i had a ton of fun on the deck i'm not saying anything negative about Kinnan. i was just enjoying the little break from it and kind of proving that i can play other decks but fair enough Kinnan's still probably the best deck i play and it's probably the deck i pilot the best and you know got me a second overall in the largest tournament in cdh history so i can't complain too hard about that yeah looking at the uh the meta breakdown i think a lot of people agreed with you there were a 19 Kinnan entries uh, yeah. in the tournament there were 29 blue farm 14 Sisse. There were nine Tivits, which is a little bit of a surprise, and nine Atraxes, followed by Rogsai and then Kenrith. And then there's the rest after that's the jungle. Uh, there were six. You got six, six Talions, six Obs, five Dargoth Grasses, five Tevish Kroms, like the normal guys, you know? Yeah, which, which is, is, is funny to me because, you know, like I said, I only encountered one Tivit. And a few blue farms. I didn't see Kinnan or Sisse at all. I never saw Atraxa. I saw one Rogsai. Like, I don't know who I was playing against or how that worked out, but I was in the jungle. It was a little wild. Yeah. Um, I mean, looking at the top 16 decks, though, the top 16 was four blue farms, three Kinnans, two Sisses, and then one each of one Sauron, one Rogsai, one Dargothras, one Timnathras, one Malcolm Tana, one Pantlaza Sun Favored, and one Rogthras. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, right on the bubble, bro. Right on the bubble, Kiki Jiki at seventeen. A Kiki Jiki deck, yeah. <laughs> I, I gotta look at Kiki. it. It's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. It's hot, dude. That deck is hot. <laughs> it's it's playing Goto. It's playing Goto Helm in the ninety nine. Yeah, that's wild, dude. <laughs> but it worked apparently, so must be good. Must be good. All right. Well, anything else? Any other final thoughts before we close this up for today? Uh, not really. I'm so tired. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, it's all good, man. Like, I'll be I'll be back up. in better spirits next week. Che- cheer up, Buttercup. You're gonna be all right. It'll be all right. Mm-hmm. You wanna take us out, man? 
Thank you so much for listening to the Colors Over Crush podcast. My name is Max Perberg, a.k.a. the number one choke artist in all of CDH history, Aww. a.k.a. Wounded Satellite. And I'm joined, as always, by my incredible, wonderful co-host, Max Pfefferman, the Italian man. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. We do have a Patreon if you want to support the channel and get some fun extra perks in our Discord, which if you want to join our Discord, the link to that will also be in the description down below. I also offer CDH coaching. If that's something you would be interested in, please contact me either on Discord by Wounded Satellite or on Twitter, where I'm also called Wounded Satellite. Thank you so much again and look forward to talking to you guys next time. Bye. Thanks, guys.